Hey, everybody. Sorry we're late. Um, a couple technical difficulties, and I will take full blame. But welcome to uh, Word Balloon, Scene Missing. It's been a while since we've done a soap scene missing, and we've got our uh, usual scene missing players here. Uh, Hillary Barta is with us. Hello, Hillary. Hi, John. Good to see you. And now we're going to test Will Pfeiffer's microphone. He's, we see him live via iPhone. Will? No, I'm sorry. Marceau, Marceau joining us, ladies and gentlemen. Ah. Uh, I don't know what to say, Will, because yeah, we're gonna have echo and stuff if we if we have you the way we are. I'm so sorry. I have a maybe, feeling. Um, maybe we could just talk about silent film and then Will could exactly, record. exactly. Give us some give us some insight on Snub Pollard, will you, uh, please, uh, Will Pfeiffer? Uh, th only through Panto, though. You have to do it all by pantomime and stuff like that. So hopefully, um, yeah. I don't. I we'll see if Will joins us again or not. I feel terrible about that because I was looking forward to his insight as well. Uh, yeah. It's been a long time since both of you have been on, but uh, good to see you, Hell, How you doing? How you holding up with all this crap? Uh, you know, you think you've had enough crap, and then the crap starts burning and choking and, you know, all the crazy shit happening in Minneapolis, and it's like, oh, no, we haven't begun to have crap. So it, it's crazy. I don't even know what to say anymore. I'm I hear like, you, man. You know? Yeah. Anyway, no, I know. Old movies yeah. is a refuge. I hate this. I hate like this all to be about um, escapism because to me movies are much more than that. But good God, you do need to escape from this stuff sometimes. Totally, man. No, exactly. And and again, that's uh, the whole point of me quadrupling up on the episodes I've been doing on Word Balloon lately is to kind of provide people with a distraction and entertaining, hopefully, distraction of conversation and. Again, you know, you guys are uh, my, my movie guys and stuff, so uh, I'm glad that actually, Hill, you, you're you like, hey, let's do a scene missing. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's true. We, should have, we haven't done a scene missing forever. I've been doing movie uh, trivia with uh, people like Tom King, uh, former Batman writer, currently Adam Strange writer, and the Benson sisters, Julie and Shauna Benson. Uh, and mm -hmm. it's fun because they are they're younger than us, but they, they know their old movies and stuff, and they really love discovering old movies. And, and that's the great thing, good Lord. Think of the hundreds of movies that have been, you know, released over the decades, and I'm sure you yourself, Phil, are are are, are you still? Yeah, man, I'm hoping you're still discovering movies or seeing movies that you hadn't seen in decades or whatever. Well, I mean, sure, there's some. I mean, occasionally they rediscover films. I mean, it still happens with silent films or sound films that have either entered the public domain or just, you know, whatever existing prints are not available, uh, and then they turn up. And, uh, you know, I, that's always exciting for me when, say, the Noir City people are, are doing Noir City Chicago and they're showing a print of a film I've never seen before. You, you know, I just love that to see a film in 35 yeah. mil millimeter, you know. Um, but more often than not, I get to see movies for the second or third or 15th time or whatever. Yeah. Hey, Will, how you doing? Oh, he's still silent. But, um, you know something, Will? I'll tell you what. We will not speak and and go to you, and hopefully that will, because it seems like when we're not speaking, you're fine. So if you don't mind, yeah, we I will I will literally, like, cue you, and, and I'll stop talking. But I would keep your mic on mute until uh, we are speaking to you. So we can now just kind of get you up and running. Say something now. Okay, you're on mute right now. But also, but uh, when when you were unmuted, we couldn't hear you. So uh, so let's look, go back to that former uh, setting. Yeah, without your earbuds, probably. Uh, yeah. So if you could recalibrate your microphone that way, and then we should be okay to hear you when you're ready. And then yeah, unmute unmute when you think you're on that previous setting. This is just what it was like in the in the Wildcat days in the 19 whatever when. They were just learning how to do film. Thomas Edison. Okay, you are yeah. on mute. Can I? Oh, now I'm hearing the echo, so clearly you're on well. Are you? I just for a second heard it. Unmute your microphone. Right now your microphone. There we go. Now I'm unmuted. And you're still hearing the echo? Because we're not talking. Okay. So, oh, and now it sounds, I'm not hearing an echo. So oh, we good? I, this Mr. is crazy, guys. It's working. I, 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 I now switched it, computers. Oh God bless you, Will. God, I'm so sorry, Will. Literally, no, no, that's okay. More, more uh, trapeze movements than poor Burt Lancaster and Tony Curtis in that fine Gina Lola Bridget of film. Wow. Well, it's been nice, guys. I gotta go. See you later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm 
just glad I was working from home, so I had my work computer uh, here. Guys, I miss you because seriously, it, it, usually at an after hours, either at Four Star or at a comic shop, we're off in a corner throwing down movies and stuff. And that's uh, I, I enjoy doing it. Jim Terry sometimes joins us. Should have called Jim Terry. He would have been great on this. You know, let's get Jim. Yeah, let's get. There's a lot of people we could add to this, but you it's know, nice. It's nice that we're not doing will missing. We're doing scene missing. <laughs> Indeed. Yes, I'm really glad you're here. Another guy, guys, that I want to suggest, and it's a guy that I don't know how well you know him, Hill. And, Will, I don't know if you know him at all, but a Noir City guy, as, as Hill was saying at the beginning of the discussion, uh, Mike Cronenberg from uh, Noir City and uh, those great festivals. And he's – I mean, yeah. he'll he'll lap us by ten times in yeah. terms of – Oh, yeah. I know him time. through Twitter and Facebook. We interact all the time. Never, never met him, but good yeah. dude. Good dude. Yeah, I know. I know him from the internet and probably from the early days. I don't know if he did a Noir Alley uh, web page, something like that. But I, you know, I remember we were in contact for a long time, and I've had some connection with the Noir uh, Foundation. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway, you know, he's like yeah. he's Eddie's, he's one of Eddie's main guys for the magazine yeah. they do for the Noir Foundation. Right. Yeah, he's a designer, right? Yeah. Isn't he? Yes. Yeah. 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 So he's really absolutely. Good. So anyway, um, yeah, I've, uh, great movies lately. You know something I'll, I'll even say, and I've said it on an earlier word balloon, uh, I'm, I still have Xfinity, Comcast, and they moved Turner to the sports package. I know. And it was like, hey, you want an extra 10, you know, another 10 bucks if you want Turner. I'm like, you know, F you. I'm like, Jesus. And I then, hate it. <laughs> well, I, I, at the beginning of April. My Turner. At the beginning of April, uh, during the film, the TCM Film Festival, I really love those documentaries. Basically, like a comic con where they're on stage and doing Q and As, yeah. and I'm like, "All right, final. It's ten bucks, and I'm not, you know, it's ten bucks. I'm not spending going out anyway. Right, so I right. may as well get back on the horse. So here we are. So and Hill, God bless you, cuts the cord and is watching an excellent commercial. Uh, uh, channel that may or may not be on your on your uh, various uh, systems, movies, which is a Weigel Broadcasting company, right? Well, uh, Hill, isn't that your uh, where you yeah. get your old movies? The movies channel, um, it's I get it on free digital TV. You know, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. This is when, when they when they started the digital thing. All the networks had to switch to digital, but also all these little Wildcat and whatever UHF as we used to call them stations. Uh, and so that's that's new with the digital. I don't think it existed before digital, and it's great. Right. They showed movies 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they do noir film noir on Thursdays all day long. Nice. And then Sunday evenings, and sometimes they sneak them in elsewhere. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Now they don't have the unlimited or larger packages that say TCM has. So even Eddie Muller and Noir City, they have to get a package from the studio, so they'll have it. Mm. You know. They're buying certain films or renting them for a certain amount of time, but uh, movies will get these. They'll get you know they have a package for a month, and then they just show those movies over and over. <laughs> kind of cool in a way because if you're locked in your house, you know, and you know what's wrong with seeing the window for the fifteenth time this month? I mean, I it doesn't bother me. Yeah. I, oh, you I got. Believe I, I believe I have an image for the window. Let me let me see. I, no, you know, that's Brothers Rico. There it is. There you go. That's nice. So, so it, it covers Will, unfortunately. But, yeah, tell us tell us about the window for a second while we're talking about it. Well, the window, I mean, short short thing a lot of people would probably get is <laughs> Will's using this opportunity to go, uh, you know, go to the bathroom or something. Yeah, I'm using it to... he's, he's closing the blinds because he's uh, he doesn't want to – he doesn't want to kill vampires while we're talking. The window. The window is a uh, based on a Cornell Woolrich story, <laughs> similar to Rear Window, the Hitchcock film. These these uh, you know stories about people peering out their window and and thinking they see crimes being uh, committed were, were were one of the one of the specialties of uh, Cornell Woolrich. And uh, anyway, it's a great film in the Hitchcock mode, and in, it's obviously based on a Woolrich story. Um, but but you know, I just love seeing these films. So, you know, after you've seen them 10 or 15 times, and I'm not necessarily watching them, you know, sitting, I'll be working and I have the TV on to the side. Uh, I'm not watching them as intently as I would if I'm really studying the film or seeing it for the first time. But, you, you know, you're watching a movie. Will, I'm sure you're like this. If you've seen a movie, you, have, you love a movie, you still love it again. Oh, yeah. But, but maybe you're watching the background players, you know, or you're looking at set design in a new mm -hmm. way. 
you know, you certainly notice the boom mic shadows more. <laughs> <laughs> Especially with some old noirs. I mean, if they were filmed on location, you're looking at Los Angeles in the 40s, or I mean, that's always fascinating. Oh yeah. God, yeah. Or or was it Val Luden, guys? I forget the filmmaker that shot so many scenes on like a uh, in front of a blank wall so that he could cut in easily easier and mm -hmm. stuff. I, I forget. Was it Luton? I forget which and director. Did, it was. I mean, Luton cut a lot of they shot, they cut a lot of corners on Luton. I mean, he made it all work, but yeah, but his films weren't programmers. I mean, you look at what you're talking about is any film that was made in a week is going to be, you know, they're going to use these sets where like, you know, you'll have a, you'll have a set up in office building and there'll be a knock on the door and the door will open and a guy will walk onto the set, talk to the guy and then he'll walk out the door and close it. That's all one shot. Yeah. And they don't even cut the close ups. They don't, <laughs> you know, that's saving money, you know, and then the set of yeah. course, looks great. it could be all anywhere. Set up, yeah. Well, I would imagine that the movie packages that movies are getting, Hill, are these, again, like kind of throwaway packages that, as you said, used to be on UHF channels. I mean, we all grew up in the five-channel world pre-cable. And yeah. so all those UHF channels, afternoon movies, late-night movies and stuff, they were filled with these things. And they're fascinating, you know, and I, I, I love watching them because of their cheapness. And as you say, too, a lot of times, and it's something we've discussed before on Scene Missing, a lot of the um, character actors on the A-list movies are the leads in the in these mm -hmm. E-list movies. Okay, well, first of all, just to distinguish between B and cheap movies and things like The Window. The Window is not a B movie. It's a great film. Okay. And I don't think the movies channel is just B movies. Like, a lot of the films they're showing where this month in the noir, uh, you know, on the, their noir schedule are uh, Columbia films like uh, The Brothers Rico, they're not B movies, okay? Um, they may not be movies with Cary Grant, but you know, they're showing classic comedies with Cary Grant too. Uh, this this month they're showing I Remember Mama, uh, you sure. know, the, which mm -hmm. is a you know Academy Award winning film. Uh, you know, so I don't know. I don't know that they're limited to that kind of films. Just in defense of the the movies channel. When you get into some of the like the Western channel called Grit TV that I also get. They do show a lot of westerns that are pretty bad or pretty bare bones. I mean, I've never seen more Audie Murphy movies in my life than I have. Outstanding. Now, now that I have grit TV and I, I've learned which are the better ones. But you know, they're, this is not. It's not. You know, they're not the greatest movies ever made. Um, I understand. Now, grit is that like the news, the old newspaper in the back of the comic books? Grit, G R I T. Is that grit? grit? Oh, grit. Yeah. <laughs> grit. Well, awesome. Yeah, but grit. I mean, grit. I don't know if grit is always westerns, but I think it's ninety nine percent westerns. Like maybe there's a maybe, maybe I'm confusing their schedule with someone else. But like they have, they'll show western TV shows. Like right now, they're showing a lot of uh, Tales of the Wells Fargo. Hilarious show. Oh yeah, oh, which yeah. is actually pretty good. And I'm I love getting to find a whole new show and that's starring Dale Robertson, who has even better hair than Will has right now. Wow, his hair. <laughs> You know, I think we're all doing good on the hair department. I got to be honest. Yeah, we are. This is you three know. good heads of hair here. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, and yeah, we're going to celebrate our old uh, 1980s uh, hairdos uh, in a few weeks if we haven't already gotten to that point yet. Yeah, I might be getting into the 70s pretty soon. When I Atta get boy. a point. Get a ponytail going. <laughs> Outstanding. I, you know, uh, Hill, have you seen, speaking of Westerns, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? The Tarantino movie. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's that's the first Tarantino film I've seen in a while. Yeah. I love the fact that the backstory essentially is all those westerns from yeah. the 60s, and especially given that it's supposed to be 68 or 69, that even that period, like High Chaparral, kind of the yeah. end of the television western explosion. I mean, it was still very big, but not as big as it was late 50s, early 60s when there were like 30 weekly. You know, I mean, you, you could probably speak better to that hill in terms of well, I mean, you get kid probably watching some of that stuff, you know, back in the well, day. you've probably seen the, the movie as well, I imagine. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah we all did. Yeah, so is the, now he's in a couple of shows. One, uh, one is sort of a dead or alive uh, type, right? That right. Is, but you mentioned High Chaparral, isn't it Lancer that the color show is more like and that's okay. a real show, wasn't it? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, 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 right, right. Who was the who? I don't even remember. Do you remember the star of Lancer? I, I don't know offhand. I can look it up. Off the top of my head, I'm not going to remember, but I, no I've problem. seen it. 
But the interesting thing now, okay, I'm not a huge Tarantino fan. Sorry, I, we don't need to talk about Tarantino though. He gets a lot. Well, but I just like the nod towards. Well, I understand. But, but here's what I'm question. You guys can tell me if you agree or not, because I've watched these shows my whole life. These old westerns. Yeah. I thought the framing, you know, the, I don't know about aspect ratio. I know Tarantino was trying to sort of get the, you know, the look of the old shows, and he's big on using certain film stocks or aspect ratios and all that stuff. He certainly knows the material. But I felt in both shows, they didn't feel right. Like something was a little off. Obviously, there were their recreations. But it it didn't oh. seem like they were going through a documentary, you know, like trying to mimic the TV <laughs> show. They never missed something. And, and maybe I'm just a nitpicker. I don't know. Uh, now, I mean, I haven't. I didn't grow up with those shows, so I hadn't. I haven't seen a, them except snippets here and there. But I know what you mean, especially when you, the scene where you have Rick shooting when they're shooting his big scene, the the first time we see him. I mean, it's like a five minute take, or you know, like camera movement up and down stairs. And I'm like, they would have never done that. <laughs> that shot in particular it does not make sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, there were people on TV that would sort of, you know, if there were directors that would occasionally, you know, like they'd work on the cheap during the rest of the, the shoot and then save it up for one particular shot where they wanted to spend some money on it. There were th- people like that. And there was some guy, and I, I'm not going to remember his name now, but he, uh, he was famous for, I think it might have been Peyton Place, but it was some famous soap opera that he shot with elaborate camera moves, which nobody does on soap operas. Yeah, yeah. So, but he was just flexing his directorial muscle, you know, uh, in his in his in his uh, dotage or what, retirement, semi retirement, or whatever you call working on soap operas. Yeah, James Stacy was the the star of Lancer, and it only lasted two seasons. So well, there you and, go. And as a little kid, I remember, of course, Bonanza, of course, Gunsmoke, but I remember High Chaparral when it was still new, and that was really kind of sixty nine seventy. So you know that was you know, a little later in that, in that period, but I am fascinated by, and again, we can move on to movies that we've been ta- seeing lately and stuff, but I am, yeah. I, I am absolutely fascinated by those. And like grit, which I don't get on, uh, in my uh, package, I should really set up a second TV so I can get whatever, you know, digital antenna stuff pulls in pull on the antenna. Yeah. Cause I know get TV as well as another digital channel that um, shows a lot of interesting vintage TV and film and everything. And I don't well, get that one. So, John, you don't want to tell people you have an inadequate package. You just want to be <laughs> Well, much like a bad commercial about impotence, I need to get a, 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 a t- an antenna extension to, uh, to, to solve my uh, dysfunction. So, yes, absolutely. So, I know Will, Will has uh, told us. Uh, Prior to this, you sent an email with, with a number of films. What are what are some of the films you've seen lately that were that you really enjoyed that were discoveries? Perhaps. Um, well, the one I mentioned, and these are all because uh, I have Turner Classics. I'm paying the ten bucks, and oh, yeah, I just the, what I love to do with Turner is, I mean, I love it because they show you know Casablanca and Gone with the, you know all the classics, but I love going through on the DVR just looking as far in advance as it'll go, and if something looks the least bit interesting, I'll just record it. You know, and then later on, I'm looking for something. So I saw one, um, 1955's, I'm checking the, yeah. Uh, There's Always Tomorrow, which is, uh, I guess, me, nope. or, or well, we could do Murder, he says. No, first I, I think I have it. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. No. Go through all my, all my no. ones here. It stars Barbara Stanwyck, Fred McMurray, yep. and it's directed by and Douglas Sir. Douglas Sir. I thought yeah. I grabbed it. Hold on. There she is. There we go. There you go. And Joan Bennett. And, and Joan Bennett, yeah. Speaking, a, speaking of soap operas, Joan Bennett uh, from uh, Dark Shadows, of course, late in her career. That's right. Yeah. And I always think of her as for the two uh, Fritz Long movies with Edward G. Robinson, Scarlet Street, and um, uh, Woman, uh, in Woman, Woman, Woman in the Window. Woman right. in the Window, right? You know, yeah. when you said when you said uh, the window earlier, Hill, I was thinking of Woman Woman in the Window, and it's I mean, again, a similar story, but it's it's a different it is a different story. Am I right? Well. Woman, Woman in the window. window. No, they're completely different. Yeah. Actually. Okay. It's a. I, I referenced uh, Rear Window. That might be a film. Well, but also Women in the Window, and I, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I think there is that similarity in terms of because that's where the little boy sees the murder. Women, Woman in the Window, correct? That's, no. win, that's the window. Oh, that's that is the window. That is the, the window. window. Has nothing to do with that voyeuristic uh, story. Okay. 
No. Okay. It's a Sorry, painting boys. that they see, and yeah. he falls in with Joan Bennett, and Dan Duryea gets involved. Not to be confused yeah, with Duryea. the other movie where Edward G. Robinson falls in with Joan Bennett, and Dan Duryea gets involved. That came out the next Star year. Street. That's Charlotte Street. Yeah. Yep. 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 I'm sorry, guys. I didn't mean to interrupt. Please. No. So no. Continue, no. So continue well about uh, There's Always Tomorrow. There's Always Tomorrow, which is um. I've seen a few Douglas Sirk movies. I haven't. I've seen like some of his classics. Is, is this early Douglas Sirk? Do you know Hill? Is it? No, no, uh, that's not, no. It's that's right in the heyday. Um, okay, because it's, it's black, black and white, white, and I just yeah, right. kind of, black and white. You know, you think of them doing color melodramas. All right. Yep. The Ross Hunter productions. You know, like uh, uh, whistle, uh, whistle in the wind. Right. Not in the wind is the uh, the one I'm thinking of. I actually have the Magnificent the Obsession. Uh, Magnificent Obsession, of course. Pointing here, there's it's a. Uh, I can't point and look at the same oh. time. Anyway, one of those pictures is a lobby card from Written on the Wind. Oh, oh that's okay. yeah, Written on the Wind. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Written on the Wind stars uh, Lauren Bacall, uh, Rock Hudson, and um, uh, Robert Stack. Robert Stack, that's right. Dorothy, right. It's very sexy, Dorothy, Dorothy Malone. Dorothy Malone. Very sexy, just, Dorothy Malone. Brilliant. But it's to me, it's one of my favorite movies. But. Yeah, but anyway, yeah. this film is different in that it's not a widescreen color film. It's more of a conventional right. black and, and white. It, yeah. And it almost tells the story more from the point of the man than the woman because it focuses a lot on Fred McMurray, who's a toy manufacturer. He's been married for years to Joan Bennett. They have um, two kids, uh, three kids, but one of them, one of them's a, like a grown young man, an older daughter, and I think there's a little. There, yeah, there is definitely a little little girl. And he just feels sort of the pressures of life. He feels his whole family is kind of ignoring him, pushing him to the side. They take him for granted. So when an old lover in the form of Barbara Stanwyck shows up, you know, it starts out with a rekindled friendship and it gradually becomes something more. Yeah. Um, and it's like, you know, I, I, I watched it because uh, I'm a, I think Barbara Stanwyck probably is my all time favorite actress if I had to pick up, you know, an actress. And I'm a huge fan of Double Indemnity. And, you know, it's always fun to see these two, you know, playing something other than the endless betrayal and murder of Double Indemnity. But right. um, it's, it's, I really liked it. It's, it's, I, for me, at least, it was a lot sort of more low key than a lot of Cirque's other films. It, it, it doesn't sort of have those really rushing emotions. And, you know, it's played a little more close to the vest. And I love the scenes of Fred McMurray in his toy fact little factory they're so atmospheric a lot of times he's there at night and it's raining and it's got those you know those windows you'd see like in a i don't know a studio where they're slanted and there's rain on them and then there's the shadowy toys are on the shelves everywhere there's little robot toy they're working on and yeah i really enjoyed it though i, I really like fred mcgurry too i've become a big fan of his lately those windows are um like the classic artist garrett that, that exactly every hollywood movie would use whether it's set in france or not you know, you're up at the you're up at the top of the building, and the rooftops are out the window, and but then you have that giant set of, you know, uh, it's a slanted wall of windows basically on one side of the room. It's like I always think of a Portrait of Jenny with those windows. Yeah. Because Joseph Cotton's studio has that kind of a thing, and it's like all it's beautifully filmed in black and white, and then there's the part where they they go to a resort, so you get saying that mid-century modern kind of setup, and yeah, yeah. I. I really liked it. I'd never seen it before. I never really heard of it before. The thing about, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, real fast. Oh, no, finish your thought, Hill, and then I'll go to the mm -hmm. peanut gallery because people are making comments, and I do want to involve them in, oh. in the discussion. Well, right. someone has a question about this film. Otherwise, I was going to talk about more of about, about the, the, it's Cirque, the thing about Cirque, and it's evident in this film. And of course, here we are. We're looking at us and that frame from the movie. <laughs> but Cirque, unlike the other directors that say work for Ross Hunter, that made you know these soap soap op, so what you would call soapy melodramas, he was an artist doing all kinds of stuff visually. That I mean, people use the term Brechtian distance. You mm -hmm. know, he would frame the actors like in in this. In, it's, I'm, I haven't seen this in a number of years, but I glanced at a few screen grabs or frames uh, that I saw today, and. The same kind of device that he uses in some of the other films is there. The actors, the characters are trapped in their environments. They're often, there's right. frames in frames, there's mirrors, they're, 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 they get, they, you know, he's using this sort of lush 1950s, obviously this isn't as, isn't as lush as some of the color melodramas, 
But that idea that you're in these well-appointed homes and yet leading this pointless, empty existence, and all you have around you is, you know, this material middle-class wealth, it's, it, and it means nothing. You know, it, it is, it, you know, it's fascinating how he almost does it totally to tone the way the actors play it, the way the scenes are framed, and visuals. It isn't yeah. like he sends it up, you know, like, you know, he doesn't do jokes. No. He, he, and he doesn't exactly undermine the melodrama. He just adds layers of meaning or possible interpretation to it. You know, he. Right. It, yeah. And it's, it's like, I mean, it really becomes, I won't reveal how it ends, but I mean, it becomes a point where you're really almost desperate to see Fred McMurray escape his family life, which isn't that his kids are fine. He's married to Joan Bennett. She's fine. He has a nice house. It's like it's not like he's being ground down or anything, but it's just little, little, little bits. And like you said, all the framing. I mean, there's all these scenes in the toy shop where there's shelves in front of him or he has to duck under something or, yeah. you know, you can just you really do feel a sense of being trapped. But th this particular storyline is part of a kind of a 1950s thing that was, was somewhat common. Um, there's a movie like Pitfall. Uh, uh, which is the Andre de Toth film where, um, you know, the husband is, you know, has this affair and it just, you know, that one involves more conventional sort of crime and stuff. But it, it just, you know, th th that, that particular thing that the actual story can be handled in a very mundane, realistic, mm -hmm. whatever way. And this movie, again, it's not unrealistic. Shirk isn't strictly realistic, though. He's sort of on no. some he functions on some of the. He's a fascinating director, and I, Douglas Sirk. He made German uh, films and uh, made films in the states, and it's great. So, so I did remember, he come from? Did he come from Ufa and then came over? Yes. Or? I yeah, watched some documentary. Of his was it last year? And they were listing all the <laughs> all the ex. Well, I don't know if they were Nazi party members, but they definitely made some movies for the Nazis. And Sirk was one of them who came over. Yeah, wow. but he. But yeah, but he was not. Yeah. No. He, no, okay. he, I mean, that. a lot, you know, we owe yeah, like most, Wilder, you know, Billy yeah, Wilder. Like Wilder. We owe, like Long, I mean, we owe yeah. a lot of Hollywood owes a big debt to the Nazis. Hollywood was sending the all the good directors over. Hollywood was the greatest collection of talent. I mean, they pulled people from Europe everywhere. Anyone who was good at anything, you know, for filmmaking came to Hollywood, first of all, for the money, and they were doing it well before, you know, the Nazis came to power. But once the Nazis sure. happened, anyone that could get out, that wasn't already in bed with the Nazis, so to speak, got the hell out of there. I mean, mm -hmm. anybody, anybody was, I mean, Fritz Lang is one of these guys. We're talking yeah, to. definitely. But, um, but the, the list goes on and on. Robert C. Odbeck, one of the greatest noir guys, went back to Germany, you know, in the 50s when he got tired wow. of the bull crap from, you know, stars taking over his movies. Uh, you know, when stars became producers and started throwing their weight around. Sure. Uh, and working with Burt Lancaster on, I forget, always forget if it was the Crimson Pirate or uh, the Flame in the Arrow, which one was the the, uh, the Admech one. But that was the movie where you just said, that's it. Because, you know, you got an actor telling a, a, a you know, the what they would the call ma maestro, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, telling him, well, I don't want to do that in this scene. We're, I want to do this instead. And he's like, you know, that's it. And I'm he was here. the money guy. Lancaster was producing his yeah. own movies. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I can't yeah. believe Burt Lancaster liked to throw his weight around. It doesn't <laughs> seem like him at all. <laughs> you know, that's so I funny. Like because <laughs> they literally, a couple weeks ago, showed both Crimson Pirate and Flame of the Arrow on Turner. And okay. I DVR'd them and then made room. And, and I'm like, I'll watch them the next time they come around. And now I'm kicking myself that I didn't watch them. Now, I want to add this one comment. And I and it's it's going back to once upon a time in Hollywood, but I I just uh, because Jack asked it in terms of uh, what we thought of the ending, and I mean really we can make it a very brief comment. I'll start and just say I didn't see it coming. Once it happened, I'm like, well, of course, you know, given what he did with Inglorious Bastards, right. it didn't bother me. But I can certainly see other people roll their eyes, and especially given the severity of the subject matter being a little bothered by it, but it didn't bother me. What did you guys think? Um, I mean, I suspected he was going to do something. I didn't know in advance exactly what, and it didn't bother me. My wife, it's interesting, because then I took her to see it, and she 
I mean, she knew it was about the Manson family played a large part. She didn't know anything about the ending. And she said, she said, I don't want to go see a movie. I don't want to see Sharon take it killed up, get carved up on screen. Yeah. And she said, tell me I'm not going to see that. And all I said is, I said, they don't show it. But I didn't, you know, so. Sure. Didn't want to spoil. What do no, you think? We, I didn't, I wouldn't want them to do a spoiler, but we're sort of talking about the thing you're not supposed to talk about. Nah, it's, it, I if, mean, if it's people been, haven't seen it by now, uh, then well, exactly. see it. Then let's just say spoiler alert, okay? Because sure. I hate that. I talk about movies from the 40s. I don't really want to talk about the ending. I mean, honestly, because you I never know who hasn't seen a movie. Sure. Because yeah, we're talking about old movies that no one's ever seen, and they're 50, 70, whatever years old. Totally agree. A lot of people haven't seen these movies we're talking about. More right. people have seen Hollywood. But yeah, right. I, I have a problem with Tarantino. I don't really want to dump on the movie because it's not going to win me any points with anybody. It's one, It's clearly a huge hit. I enjoy all kinds of things about him. I love his, you know, I love his uh, way he films things. You know, he really loves the camera, he holds scenes. Um, I don't particularly care for uh, that revenge idea that you're gonna, you know, sort of have, you're gonna, you're gonna rewrite history with a happy ending or what he considers a happy ending, right? True. And mm -hmm. me celebrating brutality and we're supposed to laugh at some of that brutality, it kind of disgusts me, you know, I, I you know, it, I, I, we could get into that. I don't know. Yeah, if you really want to talk about Tarantino and that stuff. No, no, I, the, no, this is about old Hollywood and stuff. But I, like I said, the, uh, the, you know, a lot of times, Hill, you'll know, or you, I don't know if you remember or not, because I can't remember. I think maybe Jim Terry was our third. We played Trivial Pursuit Silver Screen at Challengers one time, and yeah. the audience got really mad because it was really hard. And they're like, well, we don't know any of these movies. It is like, hard. I've got that, and it's hard. <laughs> Will, you're going to have to join us uh, one time because I would love I, I, to. Yeah. I play with the Bensons and Tom King. I literally, one San Diego night, we're all talking about old movies, and they're like, we should play old movie trivia. Like, does anyone have any books? And very silently, I'm like, I know what I'll be sending these people. So yeah. I like combed eBay and sent them all copies of Silver Screen. And so, yeah, we all get, I mean, even before the pandemic, a couple episodes, yeah. we would get together on a Friday night and pre-record a thing. But uh, honestly, to kind of involve the audience more, be based on what Hill and I experienced at, at Challengers, I added the Turner Classic Movie Trivia Book. Mm -hmm. Because that has, uh, you know, I mean, Silver Screen oh, wow. only goes back, like, it it was it came out, like, in 82 or 83. I was going to say, it's got to be, like, yeah, 30 years old, I would think. Yeah, and soon to be 40. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, it's crazy. So, I understand, but, I mean, that's what intrigues us to play oh, it, because yeah. it's really hard. Oh, and I've got mine. Cool. I've yeah. got my copy. <laughs> so, yeah, well, so you'll you'll play along. And I know, I, I've and, and Hill, I've made the invitation to you in the past, and I understand. Uh, sometimes, like, hey, you know, as much I'll as you love these one. movies, I'll try yeah, one. I get stressed out by uh, by competitions like that. Um, I remember, I remember doing the the uh, we we did the trivia contest with Jim Perry. I remember it. You know, I think I think you were hosting and answering the questions, and Jim and I were pitted against each other. And I remember I was there. There were a couple of questions where I was like, you know, you the answer was Humphrey Bogart or something, and I'm like, well, oh, it can't be that easy, you know. <laughs> now, I'm, that's what the other ones were. But the ones that were, you know, there's a few gimmies in there, and I and I was second guessing it, right? Mm -hmm. Because I, it couldn't possibly be. No one would make this a trivia question. Like who is who? You know, what was who played Rick in Casablanca or whatever the question <laughs> was? And going, wait a minute, <laughs> got to be a trick. Yeah, exactly. No, well, but also they do that, I think, and just like the game shows do it, so they, you know, they want the audience to kind of feel, hey, I knew that. Yeah. That's cool, you know, and everything. But yeah, no, I'm like, please give me the hardest. You know, make it an SAT yeah. test. I got, I got no problem with that. That's like me watching. I'm, I'm going. What the hell do these people spend all their time reading? You know, reading almanacs. What the hell? I, don't <laughs> I love I that. Love this stuff. <laughs> now, I wanted to talk about a movie um, that I saw, and again, um, they just you know, obviously, as uh, May is wrapping up, uh, they spent every Wednesday night doing Humphrey, or rather, Edward G. Robinson movies, and yeah. I was thrilled to see them. And I'm sure, and I know, Will, there's, a, there's one or two, I think, on your list as well. Sure. The one that I had never seen before was Kid Galahad with Betty Davis and Humphrey Bogart, of course. Um, and, I, and I really enjoyed it because I had uh, originally seen the Elvis version of Kid Galahad, which I love as well, uh, with Charles Bronson and Gig Young, among others. 
but uh, the uh, the the Robinson one was really fun to watch. It's slightly a slightly different story, pretty much the same story, but but different enough. And certainly they tailored it to Elvis in the early '60s version. Mm-hmm. But I'm really glad I saw it. Um, it. It was again one of those pre Casablanca. Bogey's always the bad guy. Kind yeah, of Bogey's movie. the weasel in all those movies. I love that. I absolutely love that. And yeah. also, um, it was great to see at least in my perspective, an unaffected Betty Davis. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I really enjoy Davis's movies, but this really was kind of an early programmer uh, for all of them, honestly. I mean, I, it might have been made around the time of, like, you know, that when they made Little Caesar, you know, Robinson made a bunch of other movies at the same time, and it was just another movie, and he hadn't really become, you know, the classic Nash, eh? you know, kind yeah. of uh, Edward G that he later became. And uh, but I did. I found I found it fascinating and and fun. And God, Betty Davis looks amazing. She's so willowy and uh, you know very very gorgeous in the movie and everything. And I really I, I loved it. I mean, it's your classic '30s. Everybody's tough, you know, kind yeah. of kind of films. I, I I really enjoyed it. So I don't know if you guys have seen the original Kid Galahad. I saw. I haven't seen it in a while, but I have seen it. But um. Yeah, it's I love I'm a sucker for those Warner Brothers movies. That's maybe one of my favorite periods in movies is 30s Warner Brothers because it's they're just fast. I mean, they're a lot of them aren't much longer than an hour. You know, they have the the incredible like Warner Brothers supporting cast are usually in there somewhere. And then you like I just checked, like Michael Curtiz directed this movie. Yep. Harry yeah. Carey Sr. speaking of character actors, uh one of the other cornermen in mm-hmm. the movie. And I love Harry Carey Sr. Uh, yeah, the the guy who's presiding over the Senate in Mr. Smith goes Mr. to Washington Smith. for you know others, and of course the father of uh, not not the father of Harry Carey, not that uh, Harry, as, as we know from being from Chicago, but uh, the great Western character actor mm-hmm. uh, that was you know with John Wayne and the Searchers, but also Senior made a lot of movies with uh, Senior David was as well. a star before John Wayne. He he was an older star from the silent yeah. era, early thirties, who, who who Ford you know was friends with and. He kept them in the films and stuff. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. He kept acting. Yeah, he kept that. Have you seen Have you seen that original Kid Galahad? The hell, you know. To be honest with you, I well, I grew up watching the old, you know, the '30s Warner Brothers films, the cl- classic stuff. With it, it was either George Rapp. Um, well, Rapp was Rapp was a lot, often kind of like Bogart. He was second, uh, but but he you know he was a star too. But it was it was Cagney, Robinson, Rapp, uh, Bogart. Those guys were often. You know, in, in different roles in different films. Um, I can't remember if I've seen this one or not. I was looking at the poster and like, I know I've seen some of the stuff that uh, uh, Betty Davis was in in the '30s, and I'm yeah, I'm, that's not going to help me. <laughs> no, I'm just doing it for for, <laughs> for, for effect. Face though, you put it back up. He is doing the rrr, even in the poster. He's, kind of doing, he's he's got the, he's got the cigar in the door. Mm-hmm. Totally, man. I, I I love those, and also I like that distinction of Warner Brothers films and First National films, which right. Warner Brothers would mm. distribute, but technically was a, a their, their kind of junior company mm-hmm. in, in, in a lot of ways. I mean, I don't know the full details. And by the way, mentioning Cagney as well, uh, before we were broadcasting, I, uh, I was watching The Bride Came COD with Betty Davis and Cagney. And uh, man, that is not a funny movie. It's okay. I don't know if I've ever fascinating. seen that one. <laughs> It's not particularly great, no. Yeah. And and I'm reading Cagney's biography, and I'm I'm in the early 40s, and even Cagney's like, yeah, it's not that great of a movie. And, <laughs> and, and and I think that's and it's I love how candid Cagney was in Cagney by Cagney, his autobiography, mm-hmm. in terms of a lot of films. And it's funny because even um, the on-screen rating gave it, and I think they use Rotten Tomatoes, they gave it a 62, percent which for a programmer isn't bad. Uh, isn't a bad rating, but it's I'm like, like an average man. yeah, and I'm like, other than seeing them and it's fun kind of watching them try to be funny, it's not that funny. I'm glad I saw yeah. it, but Cagney, you know, Cagney's one of those guys who was fighting the studio once he became a star and probably on his way up too. He was always fighting against mm-hmm. they just gave all they wanted to do, all Warner Brothers really wanted to do is put him into something similar than you know, they had a and just churn the movies out. And he was doing many movies in a year. If you look at the early 30s, all those guys, I, I'm not going to yeah. have a number off the top of my head, but easily they were doing five or six movies in a year. Yeah, absolutely. No, and that's what and Edward G. Robinson, about. too. 
And Betty yeah. Davis, who was fighting the studio, she was absolutely. Same yep, yeah. and it's and no, you're absolutely right. Like literally, she from no, she she didn't have as much power. She she got you know, bigger in the forties. Yeah. You know, well, think. and and Cagney literally, like you said, Hill. I mean, because he was coming from stage, is like, all right, this is a Mickey Mouse business. When I'm done, I'll just go back to New York and and go back to the stage. Mm-hmm. And and he really had no faith in the lasting you know, uh, cultural, I think, impact that Hollywood would have. And, it's, you know, especially once the talkies kicked in. Mm-hmm. So it really is interesting reading his, you know, point of view and going, yeah, I, you know, I had my farm and, I, you know, if I didn't like the movie, I'm like, hey, until you give me a better deal, I'm, I'm going to sit out. And then, of course, and I'm really fascinated to see the next time they, uh, Turner really focuses on Cagney, that decade or so when he was making his own movies and did mm-hmm. step away from the studios. And I think... I know there's a lot of really interesting movies during that period, and he was hitting this, but I, I even just for the experience of yeah, him stuff. He didn't have a great record as you know, his brother uh, became producer, and they made a number of films. Not funny at all. <laughs> yeah, in, in terms of, yeah, I'm Brad came COD. I agree no, with you, man. <laughs> Let's talk about other non-funny movies. You know, the thing is, there's, there's I got one that I know Hill and I will uh, disagree on and everything. Okay. I think it's funny, but... but there's an entire genre <laughs> Uh, and I don't know, you tell me, could get a gal ahead falls into this because I, I can't remember if I've seen it. But they're basically gangster comedies. Warner Brothers. Oh, yeah. Loved them. There's a and, lot of them that I really love. Go on. They're, yeah, they're all sort of derived from this idea. Um, in, in a way, anything that Warner Brothers did in that era with gangsters was either the serious thing, like they're going to do an, a, you know, the headline kind of expose of Public Enemy or, or Little Caesar or something like that, or it was Damon Runyon inspired kind yeah. of stuff. With yeah, the guys, right. you know, with all the, the guys doing their shit, and, you know, that's where that, you know, the Warner Brothers playing uh, company, where, where all those, sec- you know, all those great character actors. William Demarest, William Frawley. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. God, you know, I'll tell you one right off the top. All Through the Night, the bogey movie, yeah. where it really, I always say it looks like a high-budget Bowery Boys movie. Yeah. And, and William Demarest in that movie is bogey's number two, cracks me up. And it's Uncle Charlie... Times a hundred. Oh, it, it's it is basically the Bowery Boys versus Nazis. It's yeah. It, it is a brilliant entertainment. That's one of my favorite movies, and I think people have rediscovered it because it's featured on. I assume it's featured on TCM and other places. TCM, oh, yeah. Yeah. oh yeah, But just, you know, watching that on late night TV when I was a kid, I just oh my god. And it's, it's got cool. young Jackie Gleason's in it, right? Yep. Yep. She's very also, young and almost yeah. thin. There you go. Yeah, Jack's got a lot of info here. Oh yeah, Jack's on it. <laughs> no, absolutely. And no, I'm glad. No, Jackie, Jackie Gleason, and Phil Silvers. That's right, Phil yeah. Silvers. And that right. that opening scene in the diner where they're trying to get the the kind of cheesecake that Pokar really loves, mm-hmm. and both guys are just it's it's you know it's fantastic seeing both of them so young, and literally 15 years before. Their yeah. giant impact on television and everything. Oh, sure. Is Bogart, Jane Bogart, Darwell like, in that one? Does she play really? Bogart's mom, or am I thinking of somebody else? Say her name again. Jane Darwell is she Bogart's mom in that? Okay, yes, she is absolutely. Grapes of oh, Red, Jane Darwell. Right. Bogart played I, gloves. It wasn't called gloves. He wore white gloves. He's a he's a he's a sports promoter. He's a sports <laughs> promoter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got the boys coming in from Kansas City. I got to show them a good time. Yeah. yeah. No, but I mean, yeah, there's the whole underworld aspect to it, but I actually think he was probably also meant just meant to be one of those Broadway gambler types, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah another Runyon esque. And yeah. Right. Absolutely. So, oh, Jack's got another good uh, uh, comment about uh, All Through the Night. I didn't know this. Apparently, Chaikin uh, used it as his inspiration for, uh, <laughs> yeah, his Kirby That's, Newsboy. Kirby I completely believe that. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, no, and also the other guy, the. Bogart's crew, and I don't remember some of the other actors, and maybe Jack will uh, throw some names up or whatever who's watching. Um, I'm trying not to Google this. I'm, I'm trying to. Oh, you can. It's I, hell. It's okay. No, I know, <laughs> but it's, you know, really. I, I, I love that about you, man. That you know, you're always like, no, I want to remember it. I totally understand. I'm, I'm pretty good with these, but yeah, there, there were a whole bunch of players, as I recall. Uh, when they had their meeting, where they're basically Bogart or whoever is telling the boys. Um, are they all cab drivers, or is it just like more like um, 
you know, I guess I'm trying to remember what the crew because they're going to go fight the Nazis. You know. Yeah, I don't know. I think they're just literally his crew of like, you know, all right, yeah, you you shut up the dinner, you do this, you know, whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. But they probably so, call them their fit columnists, you know, those fit columnist guys, you know. Oh, absolutely. And Conrad yeah. Veidt is is the he's lead. The, he's the, he's and the Peter, Peter Laurie, of course, one of his underlings, and I mean, and that's that's why it's like literally bef right before Casablanca comes right. out. It's like made the same year as Casablanca, I think. So yeah, really? it is. Well, it's like it's 40, 42. Casablanca is forty two, isn't it? Yeah, I'm looking it up. I, I don't. Google's my friend, so I'm gonna look it up. This one's forty two. Okay. All it right. Cracks me up. I love. I and no, and I and I have another recent one that I've seen uh, so, that that fits in that Warner's gangster comedies and stuff. But go ahead. Well, no, John mentioned um, when he brought up uh, Galahad and the two different versions. Now you have the. What early '30s version with with uh, with Robinson and Betty Davis, and then I I assume it's mid '50s. Uh, with, early with 60s. Elvis. The uh, the early early one is early okay. '60s. It's post. Think about post that. Almost thirty years, and they're and they're and and they're remaking the set, you know the film script. Um, the, well, this something this is something Hollywood did all the time. People like especially on the internet now. People are going. Oh, I hate remakes. And why are they remaking this? You know, it's terrible that they do this. They've been doing this since the silent era. You know, there's classic, oh, yeah. either classic stories or just plain old properties that worked once for a studio. They own the rights to it and they remake it. And sometimes they remade the movies three or four times or more. I mean, the classic example, of course, you know, Maltese Falcon. They made that film twice before the version that everyone right. thinks is the first. The third one. Once right. is a That's comedy. The third time's the charm. Right. Well, Satan, even the window. Satan, lady, Satan met a lady, and uh, and there was a serious version of it. Uh, that, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I can't remember the yeah Saint Man Lady. That was the Ricardo, Ricardo Cortez. Cortez one, right? uh, yeah. That played, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, regarding two things, one um, while we're talking about all through the night, I'm going to name some of these other character actors. Frank McHugh is another guy in uh, Bogart's uh, crew. Yeah. Yeah. Just as fun funny as William Demarest, classic yeah. Warner Brothers supporting actor. Absolutely, and and, and, uh -huh. and <laughs> but also regarding the Window Hill, um, and that was my confusion. They remade uh, the Window in the eighties with Steve Gutenberg of all people, and it was a, a serious film. It wasn't like you know really? schlocky Police Academy oh, Steve Gutenberg. Like all those serious Steve Gutenberg movies. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Not, I'll bet it sucks. I'm sorry. Well, it was it was fine. It was fine. I mean, no, you know, again, well, DOA they remade with Meg uh, Meg Ryan and uh, Dennis Quaid, right? And Dennis Quaid and everything. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, no, everything. If it's a good story, but it as as Ebert always used to say, it would be better to take a movie that didn't work and right. fix it. An old movie, right? That didn't I, work. I wasn't I wasn't criticizing remakes because I was bringing it up, saying this thing often. Yeah. Oh no, no, no. Really Multiple versions, and there, and some of, sometimes several of them are great. I just was joking about poor Steve Gutenberg. Please, not, please, not Star, movies. Star is Born has had five or six remakes at least. Yeah, because there's a TV one that I always forget when I kind of rattle them all off. Oh, okay. and then in, like What Price Hollywood is basically the same story before yeah. that. Yeah. Yep. I actually talked to Bud Schulberg about writing the original Star is Born, and I wish I could remember direct quotes. But I really got to know Bud at several uh, big boxing matches and stuff. And nice. our mutual friend, Bert Sugar, brought us together. And I'm like, I cannot believe I'm talking to the man who actually wrote, I could have been a contender, I could have mm -hmm. been somebody. And he was, and really, I, I pumped him about Kazan and uh, especially uh, not a Kazan directed movie, but Bogart's last movie, The Harder They Fall. Mm -hmm. You know, I, no, I, it was, it was such a pleasure uh, in a handful of times. Spending a couple hours with Bud Schulberg and stuff, and be like, "Hey, can we talk about this?" Oh yeah, sure. Oh yeah, I'm oh, happy yeah. to. You know, and he'd be like, "Hey, you know who wants to make what's or like facing the crowd?" Speaking of remakes, um, oh god, uh, Jim Carrey was sniffing around facing facing the really? crowd in oh. the early two thousands. I know, I know. Okay. But in, interestingly, in this era of fake news, it would be interesting to see somebody attempt to do facing the crowd and punditry. I I think they. I mean that. I love and believe me, Hill, and I and then will. I know you both feel the same yeah, way. I love, it. I love the originals. There's no need technically. 
I would much rather people discover the originals and appreciate them for what they are. But that is a film I think they could easily make. And I asked Bud, and he goes, "Hey, it's you know whoever whatever studio owns it." He goes, "It's in their hands. I can't, I can't do anything about it." And he goes, "I think it's interesting." There you go. There's a movie. By it's the way, screenplay. Oh, the oh, yeah. screenplay. Pardon me. They're mm -hmm. showing that um, you, you mentioned Bogart's last movie, um, "The Harder They Fall." That they're showing that on the movies channel Sunday evening. So. I love that movie because literally it's him and Ron Steiger from two different schools of acting yeah. rubbing up mm -hmm. against each other. And Bogey's still Bogey. I mean, it's sad. And I asked him, I'm like, did you know? Was he, like, dying or anything? I mean, like, was it obvious? He goes, well, he would cut his shooting day short. Yeah, really. And he goes, we knew something was going on, but we didn't realize how bad it might have been. And he yeah. goes, and then, of course, you know, a couple months later, he passes away. And, and, and you loved it because it's a boxing movie. So. Absolutely, right. I love it because it's a boxing movie. And it's, it's very accurate. I mean, Bud really got grief. From writing that movie, for, I mean, the mob was controlling boxing. He, it really was sure. inc heavily involved through uh, Sonny Liston's championship uh, before Ali and everything. And in fact, when Floyd Patterson was the champion, Customato, his manager, was doing everything he could to avoid making deals with heavyweight cont contenders that were connected. And that's why, Flo and plus the fact that Floyd was a smaller heavyweight. But that's half the reason why Floyd was fighting all these weird, like Ingemar Johansson from Sweden, you know, and, and fighting him three times, or Roy Cut and Shoot Harris from Texas, or <laughs> Pete Rademacher, who was an amateur champion, literally having his first professional fight fighting for the heavyweight championship in the world. All these weird stunts because he didn't want to deal with the mob. So a lot of Harder They Fall is absolutely, you know, for being a fictional version and stuff, it's like, no, it's pretty real. Yeah. And yeah, the mob was not happy with Bub, Bud during that period, and he got a few death threats and stuff. So Interesting. pretty crazy. Love that movie. Well, to some I've extent, never seen it. I got to watch that. There, there is Bud, right? It's you know he's sort of a you know it's a guy. It's a newspaper. He's a newspaper guy, right? Now, yeah. Right? yeah. No, and and Bud was you're right. And Bud was writing for Sports Illustrated and other sport magazines along with doing his plays and screenplays and stuff. So no, you're absolutely right about that. Yeah. Yeah. No, what I else? What else have you seen? What's on your short list of recent? Yeah. Um. Well, of course. Oh, you know, and again, another another gangster. Um. Uh, comedy that I really enjoyed that I had never seen, and also again remade uh, by Woody Allen, a small time cops, oh. Larceny Incorporated, mm -hmm. with um, yeah, with uh, and I'm now I'm blanking. Did. Jane Wyman, right? Jane Wyman played his uh, niece. I think so, but it's uh, it's also a really young Anthony Quinn as the main kind of taking the bogey role as the bad guy, and he uh -huh. looks great. He honestly. It's the best looking Anthony Quinn I have ever seen on film. He really he looks fantastic, and uh, I, I love that. And then, um, oh God, uh, um, uh, what's his face? Broderick Crawford's one of his uh, underlings in uh, Larcy Incorporated. They yep. they're out of jail, and um, their their plan is to rob a bank, and they get a bus uh, a luggage business next door to a bank, and they're going to dig and break through the wall and, and go to the vault. And then all of a sudden, uh, through and Jack Carson's in it as well, but through machinations, the luggage business starts making legitimate business. Right. And they feel like they can kind of do their own thing, you know, without having to, you know. Yeah, they don't have to commit the crime. According to uh, IMDb, uh, Jackie Gleason also in this movie. Yep. <laughs> Young Jackie yep. Gleason. Yep, he has one scene, but yes, he's he's and he's great in it. But yeah, it's I love that. I love seeing mm -hmm. that stuff. And also, and I'm gonna look at I'm gonna look up the cast. The one little guy. That again, I remember him from the last hurrah. Uh, great little gangster guy. He's in all through the night. He gets killed in all through the night. Oh, little fat I know who it is. guy. Tell me, is, is that... it Edward Brophy? Is I believe him? it is Edward Brophy. That yeah. sounds right. He's in a ton of movies. He's, he's the in best. So many movies. He's, he's in, so uh, funny. Yeah, the last hurrah. I'm sure you just said that, right? He's yes, in the last I, hurrah. I love him in that. Absolutely. Hey, you're he's right. like the I little schmo. <laughs> Oh, he, he's in Mad Love as as the killer who goes to the you know the guillotine. Right, he is. Yep. Yep. He's a hilarious actor. I mean, you know, he's one of those guys. They they go, oh, we need a Ed Brophy type. Oh, let's get it. You know, mm -hmm. he he defined that character. But um, I just God, I was just looking at a movie today. I mean, I wasn't seeing the film. I was looking up stills. Um, what's it, the heck? Dance Girl Dance uh, is that the name of it? The um, okay. Lucille Ball's in it. And, uh, anyway, he's he's got a. Brophy's in that. Look up, look up that Brophy. movie. I'm doing look it right now. Dance. 
and look up the name of Ed Brophy's character's name. It's okay. Hilarious. Okay. Let's see who, let's just, who gets the first. Will. Okay. I'm just he's laughing. He's got so many. Have you got? <laughs> haven't found him yet, but hang on. I haven't found him. Uh, Dwarfo. Here's one where you play Pudgy Murphy. <laughs> That's not Dwar it. Dwarful humble, is that right? Is that it's, it's it's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> or that dwarfy, it? dwarfy humble? I, I think it's longer than that, but that's that sounds that's probably right. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, dwar it's dwarfy humble winger. Humble. There you okay, go. there you go. Okay, because yeah, it, it, it <laughs> cut it off. On, yeah, dwarfy humble winger. That's outstanding. <laughs> he plays Ziggy Hinkle Rourke. These are all different movies. <laughs> Weepy <laughs> Davis. Porky, <laughs> absolutely, and uh, and God, now I'm blanking on what his name was in the uh, last hurrah. Uh, ditto, oh, ditto, right. uh, ditto. That's right. Yeah. I just want to talk to Jack, uh, who's, who's writing. I actually um, have never seen the remake of the thing. Which I'll is, confess, I haven't either, and I know it's oh, honestly it. it's a John Carpenter classic. I know I that love the first one so much for the restraint, and this is one of the things that always divides me with my friends. Because I can't, I can't talk about the Carpenter version. But I love horror films and science fiction films. All of these, where they show restraint and they don't show the monster, right? Like Curse of the Demon, Night of the Demon, would be a I better movie if you don't see the monster until the end, or you don't see the monster at all, because it's all yep. about whether these things exist, whether the supernatural is real. So if you show them in the first goddamn frame, like the producer wanted, and the producer had his way. There's no actual tension to the story. There, the main character is not a skeptic. He's a moron. <laughs> right. <laughs> True. The audience knows this is real, but he doesn't believe it, so he's an idiot. So the story is like, when is he going to wake up? You know, I, I just, what's wrong with waiting? But now with the, in the age of special effects, you got to see everything. So oh, yeah. when they remake War of the World, Steven Spielberg has to show us the Martians in the basement. And it, guess yes. what? It's a Appointment. It's not remarkable. It's literal. They're, well, that's how they work. That's what they look like. Okay, fine. The, let's go. Let's. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, go ahead, Will. I was just going to say, with Carpenter's the thing, though, because I've seen them both, and I love them both, but it's really almost... I mean, it's two almost different different movies. movies. There's that's right here, too. I mean, you the, watch it for a different reason than you'd watch the Christian the story, Right. Right. It's the well, story. It's more the original story, yeah. Let's let's go around the horn. I'm going to throw out two remakes, and I'm like, no reason to remake these, and they really were massively disappointing to me. Taking of Pelham one, two, three with Denzel Washington, and I remember Jeff Loeb, uh, former president of Marvel Television, telling me that it was being made, and I my literal reaction was, motherfucker, why are they doing this? Because it's such a great '70s cop movie. It's the one other of one the most entertaining movies. I think I've ever seen. It's so much fun, and it just it never slows down for a second. Every character is great. It's got one of the great ending moment, like seconds of any film ever made. Yep. Yeah. And it's just a beautiful math out performance. It's like watching right. an R-rated Barney Miller episode in the best way. Yeah. Because really, they're all just so fed up with New York and world weary in their jobs and swearing their asses off. But right. everybody is amazing in this movie. And the other one that I'm like, okay, and it literally explains exactly what you said, Hill, um, the Flight of the Phoenix remake with Dennis Quaid, where it's literally just a bunch of male models and beautiful women stuck in the desert, and they're not suffering like uh, poor Jimmy Stewart right. and Richard Attenborough and George Kennedy and the entire cast. They are glistening. In the desert sweat, and it kind of cracks me up. It's so goddamn bad. So I never thought of it. it. Uh, peanut gallery, feel free to uh, add yeah. to the list. Uh, by the way, Jack mentioned Jack mentioned Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. I find a bedtime story, the original with Brando and David Niven and Shirley Jones, interesting. It's not a great movie, but I've never it's, seen that it, one. It's very curiously interesting, and that was the original Dirty Rotten okay. Scoundrels. I haven't. Well, I, I I think I watched Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Sort of watched it on TV. It looked pretty over the top to me. Yeah, it was cute. Um, I, I, haven't I, seen like I haven't seen any of the remakes you guys were talking about. And I hadn't seen the original uh, of, of Scoundrels. Uh, bedtime yeah, Bedtime Story. story. So yeah, I haven't seen a lot of compare these films. However, 
Taking a Pelham, totally agree. The first is brilliant. Why would you remake it? Haven't seen the Denzel. And what was the other one? Uh, the second film? Uh, Flight of the Phoenix. Funny. Yeah, I, I've only seen the original. Um, but yeah. that brought to mind a movie called Five Came Back, which is like, uh, I don't know if it was late 30s, uh, but it's oh, a, you I'm, know. I was thinking, go on. No, no, no. But I, what I need to re I need to watch that again. I think I saw that many, many years ago. And I always thought it was kind of like Flight of the Phoenix, where people are stuck, oh. and then they have to get out of the jungle or wherever they are. And uh, you know, that kind of, and so then it's all the people, all the the plot is all these people that are trapped, and who who ends up being the good guys and the bad guys, and whatever. Okay. Oh no, I and it's funny because when you mentioned Five Came Back, I was thinking of the great documentary and book. That's what that I was came out about all the World War Two. The, the directors of the 30s that went to war right. and what happened to them post-war, right. William Wyler and John Capra. Cusin, Capra and, can, and, uh, yeah, yeah, George yeah. Stevens. Yeah, and, fascinating. And mentioned fascinating. The name of the movie. I mentioned the name of the movie on Facebook or someone's, and that's what exactly what someone said. Oh, you should see this movie. And I'm like, well, that's not the one I'm talking about. You know? <laughs> well, they, they, they use the title. Book's great, yeah. Book's amazing. The, the Netflix documentary, they made pretty goddamn good, too. Really good, too. Because yeah. then they can obviously see all the films and footage and all that. So yep, yep. So oh, and, and you know, like a lot of the films that these guys made during the war, a lot of the, uh, Why We Fight series and all that stuff. That's stuff's mm -hmm. available too. You yep. can actually watch the films themselves. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. Can, can I just put my little plug in here and just say John Wayne did not serve in World War II. Nope. John <laughs> Wayne. Okay, that's all I want to say. Oh, no, no, no. I got more to say about that because Scott Iman's John Wayne biography is absolutely fascinating. Whether you like John Wayne or you don't like John Wayne, it's an incredible book. And they spend a God, if not a, I mean, and it's one of those dictionary sized books. Mm -hmm. And they spend, if not a full chapter, at least half a chapter of Wayne begging to serve, knowing that he screwed up with not, not immediately enlisting uh -huh. and trying to get like kind of. Asking even uh, John Ford to use his pull uh, to get in some sort of special service capacity because he didn't want to, you know, be be an actual grunt or anything like that. God right. forbid. <laughs> but um, you know, it's it's okay. amazing and I really. To, uh, what's that? Where did it come from? Like, who's he talking to? Where that? Because the story that Ford told is that he said, "Wayne, you got to you got to get into the service. You got to do this." And Wayne and Ford's take on it was that Wayne was worried about that if he left now when his career was just starting to take off, because you know in the '40s is really what when he got made. Absolutely, out of the B movies, he was worried, and that and so this this is news to me. Now I haven't read that biography. It's amazing, and yeah, no, all of that stuff is true up front, and then realize that he screwed up and is literally writing to Wild Bill Donovan in charge of the OSS. Mm -hmm. Can I do something? Can I whatever? And and Ford like, hey, you fucked up, you know. Well, it's like I'm not gonna. And he made fun of him for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Bond used to okay. give him a lot of help. The, the chronology of the war here. When was he trying to get that? Like when is 43, he like 43, 44. 40, well, 44. That's pretty late in the war. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But that's what I'm and saying. July 44. I'd like to get in. <laughs> yeah. My patriotic duty is to get into it four years later, or whatever. And and I'm leaving. Cut him. Just a tiny bit of slack that he did go off into some uh, heavily fortified theaters of war and did USO shows for people that were definitely in the thick of it. But again, was able to like kind of fly in, do his mm -hmm. couple days of, of hey, how you doing? All right, I got to get back to Hollywood. See you later. Yeah. And it's so funny, guys. I literally just bought, and maybe the next time we talk, uh, I'll have read it by then, uh, a great, bi uh, not biography, but uh, really focusing on Jimmy Stewart's War service. Oh, okay. And and just uh, all the stuff. I mean, I'd heard the story. I mean, I've heard the stories about Stewart and Clark Gable in particular. Oh, another guy that I know gave uh, Wayne grief about uh, not serving was Robert Montgomery when they were making they were expendable. Oh. Well, I, I brought it up partly just because I wanted to get uh, a little dig at Wayne. But the thing about <laughs> Wayne, there are so many myths about this guy. People build up. They they so wanted him to be this heroic character that he wasn't in real life. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it ticks me off that of course he then played that character in interviews in real life. He talked sure. 
a peak, you know, this is what Americans should do. And this, you know, his famous, you know, Playboy interview and all that crap. And, oh, yeah. Well, you know, even he, in the 50s, in the 50s being such an important part of the Un-American Activities Committee. And and really, I mean, there's a great, I don't know if you guys have seen it. It's on YouTube. The, the Johnny Carson of England, Michael Parkinson, had mm -hmm. him on in the 70s and really challenged him and said, so what did you guys accomplish exactly? Well, we got a lot of bad people out of Hollywood. Really, like Larry Parks, that really made a big difference. And it really yeah. is awesome. Like, he's yeah. polite, yeah. but he's not letting uh, Wayne off the hook. And to Wayne's credit, he took it. He didn't walk he didn't off or anything like that. Set. He didn't get up and leave the set. Or no, no, like yeah. like a Bill O'Reilly or some of the other assholes of today. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's honestly, but it's a fascinating Here's the thing, book. John. I did, the thing is, and the only reason I can look, John Wayne's gone. And yeah, I yeah. like I like John Wayne as an actor. I like a lot of his movies. Me too. I don't like bullshit. And especially I agree. bullshit that matters. Because when you're talking about living and dying and fighting wars, it matters. And there's some serious patriotic bullshit that people throw around. And the, this, the lies, the fantasy kind of things that are created, there's this whole... Okay, I, I recently read a really good biography of Robert Ryan. Now, Robert Ryan was a little too old to go in the trenches himself. But he did enlist and he worked training stateside I think. but he, he was in the service but he was also a genuine tough guy yep and mm -hmm. you know and there's stuff in there i'm not going to you know tell i'm not going to go through the whole biography but he he does stick up for some people that wayne was bullying on set and on a film here and there and wayne would back down from a guy who could actually you know you know just right. knock him out. but 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 the thing is is, is that there's this myth that when Ryan, who actually stood by his ideals at the time and came out, you know, made some public statements about the Hollywood 10, or I forget exactly when it was during that, you know, during the late, late 40s period, uh, you know, which outrage was going on that he was objecting to. But being public about it was a, you know, a big deal, right? Because he would he was getting death threats because he made he had public statements that were talking about freedom of the press or freedom of speech, rather. And um, so the myth is, is that Wayne came to his house and showed up with a shotgun and stood in front of his house and said, well, I may not agree with your politics, but I'll defend your right to say, speak your mind. Never happened. Ha! People have told me this. Certain people that actually work in comic books have told me this. <laughs> like, well, you know, John Wayne did this. Like, no. If you go back and look, apparently he's, he did this for all kinds of actors. Like this story kept repeating itself. And if it ever happened, it certainly didn't happen to Ryan. Ryan being a pretty famous case. Sure. Mm -hmm. Ryan. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. No, honestly, Hill, I'm, I'm thrilled that we're talking about this because I agree with you. And Iman's biography of Wayne is very much warts and all. Mm -hmm. And I, and, and very much documents how shitty Wayne could be, including that horrible playboy interview. Um, and it is horrible. But I do kind of love in today's era of cancel culture and um, looking back and, and shame and retro, what I call retro shaming, which is kind of a byproduct of cancel culture, where right. literally uh, a different example, and I'll get back to Wayne, uh, one of the uh, down south universities has the Lillian Gish Theater. Yeah, and yeah. all of a sudden somebody did a little research and said, hey, wait a minute, she's in um, Birth of a Nation. Uh, let's change that name right now. And it's like, oh, fuck you. Yeah. Fuck you. You really think Lillian, little Lillian Gish is really that political? It's like, come on. But back to Wayne, he got a lot of grief in like the last couple of years about that Playboy interview. And I'm like, hey, you know what took care of that interview back in uh, when John Wayne did it in 1970? 1970 did. Because yeah, he got it, a it lot of shit back then. then. Yes. Yeah. He got a lot of shit back then for all I that did. stuff. And it's okay to remind people of that. But it's like, look, just calm the fuck down. It's okay that you just discovered this, but that was 40 goddamn years ago. Oh, yeah. I don't know what you're going to accomplish other than, oh, look, and, but it, but you're, it's fair to point out that, yeah, I mean, it's and it's ironic because, of course, Wayne is one of the stars of Liberty Valance when the legend is bigger than the, the truth. The the internet, legend, and he was the living it. Ridiculous that way, John. I mean, so many things people, oh my God, do you believe this happened? And then, and it just goes around and around and then mm -hmm. someone else discovers this outrage. Well, Actually, that happened 20 years ago, guys, you know, because no one's checking the date on it. But, oh, but it's still terrible. Yeah, I know. But, well, it is, no, but it's like, yeah. okay, now what? Now what? Yeah. You've discovered it. Congratulations. I'm no fan of the cancel culture. And like I said, 
my reason for bringing it up is it's still I'm being not saying you're hill. I'm not saying you're being used today. We haven't learned a friggin' thing. If people still think we should have stayed in Vietnam and we would have won it, mm -hmm. it's like, well, then we haven't learned a thing. I'm yeah. with you, buddy. No, well, no, no. You know, it, it matters today. What happened then? You know, even when it comes to the people testifying uh, or not testifying back with UAC and all that, those were different times, and people in where they were facing, you know, uh, kind of decisions that that, that, that I'm not going to necessarily judge everybody on to condemn them. But I am going to be a lot. I'm going to feel a lot better about the people that said no. I'm not naming names because it's none of your friggin' business, and that's not what this country's about. But Schulberg. Bud Schilberg was like, I mean, Bud Schilberg was worried about his career, yeah. and he and he named names. And again, when I uh, published, uh, I put out my my audio interview with Bud and on the Word Balloon feed, and a couple younger people are like, oh, Bud Schilberg, you know, he named names and stuff. And it's like, hey, let's see how you do if you were in the middle of the 1950s in your career and you faced the kind of things that the Hollywood Ten, Dalton Trumbull, and those guys, and and Edward G. Robinson even to a smaller mm -hmm. degree faced. Because they stuck to their principles yeah. and it cost them their careers. Yeah. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. Some people made names, some people didn't. The people that didn't were usually blacklisted. Some of the big stars were able to, you know, squeeze through because the studio they were important. There's a lot of bullshit here that had nothing to do with politics, but more has to do with money and studios and power. True. But the real people, real people, um, you know, uh, decided not not to testify. And some people who testified later said it was a terrible thing. They tried to find the people that, whose careers they did destroy and they apologized or they at least publicly uh, you know, tried tried to make amends. But then you have people like Elia Kazan and others who they just ended up deciding, I'm going to justify this for the rest of my life. So you have to take them at their word that they thought this was the right thing to do. So fuck them. Right? They want if you're if you're saying I had to do this, you don't understand what I was going through. That's one thing. But if you're saying no, I did this because oh, you know, really those people were communist rats. Well, fuck you, because that's not the reality. Is they were going after everybody, and it was they were going after Jews because they oh, were yeah. Jews. Yeah. not because they were communists. They're going after liberals because they were liberal, not because they were communists. Right. The only communist tracks that were ever made in Hollywood were at the behest of the. The government of the United States during World War II, when they were making pro-Soviet, yeah. those are the only Mission, movies we ever made. And Mission those, to Moscow comes right. to mind. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the classic the example. Films that were made at the behest of whatever I forget the guy who you know Roosevelt's guy who they sent to Hollywood to make these movies, and then those people were they used those movies against the Hollywood people. You're right. Later, right, the Republicans when they get into power flip the tables and said, now we're going to. Now we're going to roast all you guys for oh, making absolutely. the movies that our actual government asked you to make. Mm -hmm. Lucy I mean, was a was an advocate of the liberal side, and it it hurt her early on on I Love Lucy. Please, will excuse me. No, oh. no, that's okay. That's I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, you can, you know, I think one of the movies we were mentioning off air was was it illegal with Edward G. Robinson? Yeah. Yeah, I got the poster for that. I'll, I'll and bring that's, it up in a second. Unless I'm wrong, I mean, I don't think that's a big budget studio movie. I think, I mean, Eddie had some. Oh, it was Warner Brothers. Okay, I'm wrong. I know those guys. Some some of them did have some comparatively lean years, but like Hillary said, they never really stopped working. Well, you know, actually, were, what happened with Robinson, as I understand it, was he went back to Broadway. But he was definitely. Have you guys? I, I'm, I'm well, guessing Eddie, Will Eddie saw it. Considered a uh, uh, peak, right? He was sort of like. He had right, two, he had his. Right. He, but it, no, he did not like, get blacklisted, I don't think. Well, I don't know, Will, because I was going to ask, did you see Trumbo, the movie Trumbo? I haven't seen Trumbo yet. Oh, wow. Actually, yeah. Guys, I, I can't recommend before, it enough but, because yeah, it really, really – Brian Cranston is amazing. And I got to watch it. Just as transformative – as he was playing Lyndon Johnson. Okay. I saw way. that and I really like that. Yeah. He disappears and becomes Dalton Trumbo. And it is so amazing. And also, Helen Mirren is incredible as had had a hopper. Mm -hmm. I forget the name of the guy who plays John Wayne. He doesn't look like John Wayne, but he evokes the spirit of John Wayne. And Michael, god damn it, I always forget his name. I want to say Showalter, uh good good current character actor, plays Edward G. Robinson, looks just like him oh, and okay. sounds like him. Also 
the guy who I'm gonna, I got to look up the cast because this cast is so incredible and everybody is so great. The guy who, they got to play Otto Preminger nails it. The guy they got to play Kirk Douglas and everything about Spartacus nails it. It no, is so great. And I Diane Rose, Trumbo's I wife, everybody. Dak- um, Dakota Fanning plays uh, – Tr- or not Dakota, or his sister plays uh, Trumbo's daughter. Oh, my God. It is so, so good. And I think is a reasonably accurate for being a Hollywood movie depiction of the Blacklist era. I will – I'll check it out then. I don't know why I haven't seen it, frankly. It's out – I mean, I think it, it – I know it was nominated for Best Screenplay. Mm-hmm. Um Jay Roach directed it. John McNamara wrote it. Um, oh, yeah. I forgot. Louis C.K. is even in the movie. Yeah. Speaking so, of Cancel <laughs> You know, he plays Alfred. I got to look up the cast. Um, got it. Honestly, it's so good. And another one that I literally just saw because it was on Amazon Prime and I hadn't seen it for a while. And I love it. Uh, the early 70s movie that Martin Brest directed, The Front, with oh, yeah. Woody Allen starring, where he's That's the front for the movie. writers and stuff. God, and I love that movie too. So many people who made that movie were blacklisted. Zero yeah. Mostel and a lot Hersh- of the writers. Herschel and Bernardi's that has in it. Great yeah. Yeah. Final line from Woody Allen. It's like, that's. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't want to spoil it because that because the whole line, it's worth. Yeah. It's oh, yeah. Great. So, so Michael Stolberg is who plays Edward G. Oh, he's excellent. He's in, yeah. You know, and he's oh, God, good. the King brothers are played by, and speaking of again, Poverty Row Hollywood. The King Brothers are played by Stephen Root and John Goodman, and they oh. are so fantastic. And John Goodman is – have you seen this, Hill? I have not. You will love this movie, man, because especially when Trumbo is writing those oh. shitty two – you know, whatever, four-reelers for all those crappy westerns or whatever that the King Brothers were making in the 50s, and Trumbo was writing them under an assumed name. There's just an incredible scene uh, – uh, several scenes of, of Stephen Root and John Goodman as the King Brothers – and and it's so great. I mean, that's the thing. It's funny, but it's also if you don't know the story, it's shocking because you're like, I can't believe this would happen in America, but it did. Yeah. And I they really that. they lay it all out, man. It's so it's so. All right, so now I got to see who played uh, stupid um, Dean O'Gorman. I have no idea who he is. He plays Kirk Douglas, and they even digitally put his face in a few Spartacus scenes. Oh, the really? Great, the great scene in the pit when Woody mm-hmm. Strode Woody is Strode. fighting Kirk Douglas, and and they put they put him in there. Um, and uh, Christian Burkle plays Otto Preminger, and it's just outstanding. I can't, okay. cannot recommend it enough. I will seriously. check this out. It's so it good. Killed me. Trumbo wrote in the bathtub. I could never. I could never. They show that. that. <laughs> There's a great. It would drive me insane. Great public television documentary covering the story with a lot of Trumbo footage and everything. Oh, cool. It, like, it's amazing. Oh, I want like an American Masters kind of thing or something, or was it? Yeah, it was. It absolutely was. And they even read like actors read. Real Trumbo letters and things like that. Oh, okay. So, John, yeah, he, thank you, thank you yeah. Naka. I appreciate you that you're enjoying the conversation. Yeah. That's great. We love doing it. He wrote in the bathtub, like, uh, is that Aldo Hunsecker? Is that the, the name of the character in Laura? Oh, JJ? <laughs> JJ Hunsecker? <laughs> you know, who am I thinking of? Was Waldo, what was Waldo's last name? Oh, uh, in, uh, in Laura. In Laura. What's yeah. his last name? Oh, I know. Yeah. Leyendecker? No. Is it? Yeah, but it's something similar. Anyway, but he writes, but he's but there's a scene when Dana Andrews comes to his apartment and he's in the bathtub reading the newspaper and whatever. <laughs> this elaborate thing, and he throw, you know, Dana Andrews throws him a towel. <laughs> By the I, way, brief, brief yeah. mention of Sweet Smell of Success also on Amazon Prime this month. And what I mean, a great that's one of my all time favorite movies. Oh, yeah. Sorry, what, what's that? Sweet Smell of Success. Oh, well, that's Caster and Tony. Yeah, we're talking, yeah, Hunt Second. Yeah, that, yeah that that's why I mentioned it. Yeah. That's one of the, the great later noirs, and and mm-hmm. without a doubt, the best performance by Tony Curtis in any movie ever. Oh he's yeah, so, he's amazing. He's yeah. so great. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I agree. I, it's it's an amazing movie, and I and you know I am fascinated by that press agent era. It's so much so that I will admit to buying. Uh, Woody Allen's recent autobiography. Oh yeah, because he spent several chapters talking about being a young gag writer for all those press agents, so that he would write a gag and it'd be, oh, Red Skelton was overheard saying at twenty one, blah blah blah. You know, so there you go. There's your paperback. <laughs> well, we got a library of reference for everything. <laughs> I didn't you plan know, this. I swear. <laughs> there was no, there was no collusion. No. So, so should we go back? <laughs> should we the go line? back to? Other movies that we've uh, we've seen recently. Well, I've, I've got 
I've got other. Oh, please, yeah, anything. Else. No, no. I, when you mentioned you mentioned uh, the dialogue, the you know, Odette's dialogue, and I don't know how how is it if any of that stuff was rewritten. But you know, like cats in the bag, bags in the river. I mean, just it's so it's, good. So many lines that are just like God, I can't believe Come here, it. Sydney, I want to chastise you for a while. <laughs> <laughs> when in in di in diner the movie diner that's like one of the cute little subplots they got the mm -hmm. kid that has memorized sweet smell of success and every time you see him he's quoting from the movie oh, and when God. sydney when sydney uh, pours out that poor uh, what's your name oh. um, barbara barbara I nichols yeah. barbara nichols right you. Barbara oh that nichols. is such a sick she knows exactly what's going right. on it is so sad and it's, it's like it's lit it's Larry Tate from Bewitched that she's whoring yeah. about. <laughs> David White. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. Yeah. And how about oh, another, another movie like that, Bad and the Beautiful, the Kirk Douglas Oh, movie. yeah. I love that one, too. That's a great film. Yeah. yeah. That's so good. Movie. And that's oh, got the whole Val I had no Val idea. Luton. I didn't know he directed it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, got the Val Luton cat people, like, little subplot at the beginning. Yeah. Right. And, you know. I, without a doubt, that's they definitely referenced that. That's how they got on the B pictures. They made they made cat people, but I don't think it's supposed to be Val Luton in any other no, way. No, no, no. It's just, just that anecdote. History, yeah, Hollywood history and lore, and then you know, yeah. Because yeah. some people say, "Oh, this is all about Val." Luton. Like, no, because no. he never got out of the B pictures. You know, well, he was yeah, like, and life ended tragically and all yeah. the rest. Yeah, yeah. Have you, have you guys have either of you ever seen? Um, Kirk Douglas stars in a movie called Two Weeks in Another Town. Uh, I think it, Robinson's in that, perhaps. Oh, yeah. is that the one where he's in Italy or whatever? Or no? Is it supposed yeah. to be like a Bad and Beautiful quasi sequel kind of thing? Well, or? a lot of people see it that way, and I, I, you know, I haven't ever watched the two of them together. And I, I only saw the Two Weeks in Another Town once on screen. I love to see movies for the first time on screen, so I sure. often wait, but then. But I haven't seen it shown anywhere else since then. Any, any, Turner any, showed it. I saw it on Turner a few okay. months ago. It's it's it, it's uh it's got this just it, it's another Min Minnelli movie, and I love certain aspects of of his melodramas, you know, as opposed to his musicals, where he brought that design and dramatic use of camera that he used in musicals into a melodrama, you know, into this mm -hmm. melodramatic scene. There's a scene in this with with uh, Douglas driving a car that you got to see. I mean, it's just I love when movies just sort of take off, and it's almost as if you're in the mind of the character. You know, like like we we're leaving realism behind here and enti entering this kind of emotional expressionism, right? Oh, I yeah. just love that in melodrama. That you know, people that go, "Oh, that would never happen," or "That's unrealistic." I go, "Yeah, but it's a friggin' movie." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, more. even in <laughs> in like Minnelli's uh, Meet Me in St. Louis, which is a musical, but there's the my favorite scene. That whole music movie has no music. The Halloween, Halloween scene, Halloween which scene. is like a dream. It's like the greatest Halloween scene in any movie. It's so you know just magical. Well, that film works as a drama too. I mean, it, no, it, definitely, yeah. It's it's a dramatic musical, you know. Um, All right, we get, we got a couple of other movies that you guys mentioned to me in the emails that I did want to talk right. about. Will, sure. uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this up here. Oh, I just watched this last night. I I, I popped in the Criterion uh, disc. I got a while ago. I can't remember when I got it, but uh, this is a uh, it's a like classic pre code movie. It's based on a novel by um, Faulkner. Oh. Sanctuary, yeah. which is of course a lot more adult, a lot more grim and brutal than the movie that resulted, but the movie that resulted is still pretty grim and brutal at times. It's about a, a Miriam Hopkins plays Temple Drake, who's this young party girl. She's, you know, got all these different boys. She ends up, um, she gets in a car crash with her date of the evening. They end up with these gangsters and she gets raped in a barn and then essentially dragged off to be his kept woman at this whorehouse. And then, you know, melodrama ensues from there but it's it's pretty good and miriam hopkins is great in it and uh jack the director LaRue. whose name i yeah. cannot remember hmm? jack larue is the bad guy he's great too and he reminded me of oh, who's the, the actor who was in he he was in scorsese's movie he was in vinyl the tv show i gotta i gotta look it up it's a Popular actor right now, drove me Bobby crazy. Bobby Carnival or Bobby Carnival. Yeah, he reminded me of him. And sure. they do sure. the 
the director of Temple Drake does a great thing every so often where he will have the characters, and I can only imagine how this looked on a big screen, an extreme close-up of them looking right at the camera and either just staring ominously or addressing it with both he, Jack LaRue, and Miriam Hopkins, and it's like, it's really startling. Yeah. It's 1933, a directed by Stephen Roberts, guys. Yeah, oh, and the, oh, I Mark. think Carl Struess was the cinematographer who he he was, uh, was speaking yeah, of. He, people came up from Germany. It was Carl Struess, absolutely. Well, I remember. To be honest with you, Will, that's mostly what I remember the film. I remember the faces of uh, LaRue and Hopkins, but the way that movie is shot, like, She's, I guess she's locked in a barn, but they have the wooden slats. Like, yeah. you know, well, Wells used it in, in, in a pretty famous seed in, uh, what was that, in Mr. Arcaden. But, but you yeah. know, you have these slats with light coming through, and it's just just really gorgeous black and white. Oh, it's beautiful, yeah. yeah. Sort another of film, going by the way, Another film beautiful. that they adapted, they adapted this movie with uh, Tony Richards, or no, Tony Richardson directed it, but uh, Lee Remick was Temple Drake in the uh, remake. Yves Montan. Harry Towns and uh, Bradford Dillman, among others, uh, in the movie. Harry Towns, there's a name. Yeah, man. I, like He's I can see Lee Remick in this role, though. Well, I, I haven't seen the remake, and I love Lee Remick, so I, maybe I should someday. But I, what, mm -hmm. it's one of those things where you're like, really? Okay. They're making remake it. I'm not they, they use the corn cob pipe in the remake, I'm thinking. That's right. You know, yeah, in the, in the novel, she's famously, well, she's raped with a corn cob, I guess. And, uh, wow. It's implied that the guy's impotent. That's why he used it. Exactly. Wow. And in this movie, of course, you don't, you just see Jack LaRue sort of moving on her ominously and then scream cut to black. But some wise guy make, on the set direction, I guess, there is a box of, like a crate of corn cobs sitting just off you know, to wow. the side in that scene. Wow. So, yeah. and according, I mean, yeah. I never read the novel, but the notes really in the... Curious. Hmm? Well, the notes in the DVD implied it was so like such a notorious novel that anyone who went to the movie would know exactly what that was referring to. Even wow. if you hadn't read the book, it was one of those things that was topic of conversation. So, well, and again, a pre-code movie. I mean, and again, those yeah. man Turner, I think last year did a whole like month of pre-code movies and stuff. And I love the pre-codes. Oh, it's the best, man. Oh, good. fascinating. Babyface, I mean, it's Stanwick, you, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's, oh, it's, with, you know, Babyface. America was closer to European sensibility for just a few years. And then, boom, you know, the code shut it down. Okay. And we, we, got, we got great comedies and all the double entendres that came out of some of those comedies in the, in the post code or during the code era. But we lost that yeah. sort of, you know, like we're going to be just, more direct and adult and yeah. everything else. Just more adult. And it's, you know, in because you mentioned Babyface, where a young, very young Barbara Stanwyck, she literally – sleeps her way to the top. I mean, totally. she will go in an office, the door will close, it's obvious she's having sex with the guy, the camera will pull outside of the building, move up to the next floor, and yeah. she will keep doing it. And one of the guys she seduces is a very young John Wayne, who's yes. barely yes. recognizable, but as soon as he speaks, you know exactly who it is. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That's funny, absolutely, and, man. And who's the baby face uh, character actor? What's that guy's name that she uh, is one of the guys on the way to the top? Oh, I yeah, I'd have to look it up. Look but it you know, up. another because we played a sissy in the parlance of the day, right? The sissy character, yeah. I'm you know, because a lot of I mean, both in that movie and in Temple Drake and virtually most pre code movies, I mean, there's always like some you know, slightly dirty jokes. Or there's a scene where the actresses strip down to their underwear for virtually no reason. But also, like you were saying, more adult Hillary, there's a, the, in Babyface, she's good friends with Teresa Russell, who's, or not Teresa Russell, Teresa, Teresa Harris, Harris. Yeah. who's Teresa an African-American actress, who is for once not playing a maid, not playing a domestic. She's playing her, essentially her equal, her buddy, her friend. Yeah. And you just didn't see that in postcode movies at all. Agreed. Yeah, no, I mean, it's a really, and, and I remember she starts out, she, she's in Pittsburgh, maybe, when she, at the beginning of the film. She's working at her, her dad's speakeasy, you know. Her dad's, like, pimping her out, essentially. Her, her dad is essentially doing that. And then she goes, she befriends this German professor guy. It's very bizarre, yeah. He's teaching her, what, what, he's, like, showing her what what what, uh, what famous philosopher, I mean. Nietzsche. Yeah, he's, he's like, Nietzsche, yeah. And, you know, it's. It's like 
you know, and he's like teaching her, how, you know, yeah, you yeah. need to use this situation to empower yourself. Right. And, and she begins her climb, you know, literally climbing from one man to another. It's a crazy movie. And again, it's like an hour long, essentially. Yep. You know, it's, it, and it moves like lightning and yeah, it's good. But even for it, for its era, baby thinks is an extraordinary film. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I love Stanwyck. I mean, I especially love Stanwyck in that period. She's just, she just always seems like the smartest person in the room, and there's just this thing about her. Yeah. There's yeah. a great, there's a great Stanwyck biography that came out in the last five years, and I, I, I gave it to a friend, and have yet to uh, have read it myself. And I gotta stuff, check that out. Yeah, I, I wish I had the title handy. Uh, Hill, I wanted to ask you about another movie, and I want to make sure I'm getting the right one here. Yeah, there it is, The Brothers uh, Rico. The Brothers Rico. Tell you me got about the, it. the Italian poster. Have How you about seen that? It? Never I seen it. Tell me about it. Yeah, huh. it. yeah. Well, it's it's a 1950s film, uh, a, a 50s gangster movie. But I don't. Someone will have to tell me this. Maybe one of the, the viewers. It may be. It's certainly the it's certainly the earliest off the top of my head that I can think of of the the gangster family film. I mean, I mean. Well, okay. There's there's films in the '40s where there's brothers, you know, one guy, sure. one guy on the wrong side, and all that stuff. Oh yeah. But this is where everybody's sort of in the mob, and and it's from the inside, you know, like some of the guys have gotten out, and the other guys are trying to get out, and but it's it's just all about the family, the Italian, you know, the Amer Italian American family, and them being sucked, pulled back into it, and uh, Richard Connie plays this kind of tragic figure. It's sort of, well, I don't want to, I don't want to give away the ending, but um, it's really fascinating. It's really grim. There's a couple of really great scenes in it. Um, it's, it's one of those Columbia fifties noirs. Wow. They, I've I'm never look, seen that. I'm looking at the cast. All right. So you got Richard Connie. I always love seeing young Catherine Crosby, Bing's second wife from all those minute made commercials and all my variety shows. <laughs> but you go back to, Brothers Rico and Anatomy of a Murder when she was a young actor. I'm always very interested in those. Diane oh, yeah. Foster also in the movie. Uh, who else? Ah, James Darren. I love Jimmy Darren. I'm sorry. I know he's made a lot of cheese, he's, but he's I love one Jimmy of the Darren. brothers. He's one of the brothers Rico. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, any other uh, names uh, jumping out at me here? Well, it's what's his name from the uh, from the Untouchables crew. You know. Um, oh, uh, I bet I'll recognize him in a second. Yeah, he's, Richard he's Richard Richard Bacalang. No, no, no. He's what? Uh, you know, I know Paul, Richard Back. Paul, Paul, no, it's Paul. Uh, yeah. Paul Dubov. Yeah, Paul, Paul Dubov. Paul Perserni. Is that his name? Paul Perserni. Actually, I'm seeing it as uh, if it's D U B O V. Dubov. Dubov. No, well, his name is he Paul Phil. He's Phil. In the the <laughs> okay, I don't have the IMDb in front of me. Yeah, I sorry. think his name is Paul Perserni, who was in the Untouchables, and I think he's the guy that's in the. I could be wrong. I could be getting the actors' names. Before. I'm going to look up the Untouchables cast, and I'll tell you in a second. No, I'm look. Up, I'm going to look up the movie. I'll tell you in a second. Will you I talk love that? I love right. that. Uh, I'll Jerry talk about myself. Go ahead. <laughs> well, a moth just flying. Do you see the moth? A moth just flew into my screen here. No. Jeez, right. a very big moth. Okay. Catherine Grant play. She plays the. In in that murder, she's the woman at the bar, right? She's the daughter yeah. of yeah the the the, yeah. the rapist. She's the daughter of the rapist. Yeah, Barney. That's another great movie. Well, oh god, obviously. See, this what, is why I love my father. What's that? Was he a rapist? What's that? Was he a rapist? Is the question right? I don't know. That's true. That's that a good movie, point. You have no that idea. Movie, that's that a movie does not make that clear at all. That's no, a very good point. Is. No, and especially again without spoiling the way it ends. My dad was yeah. awesome, and every now and then there'd be an obscure movie at like two in the morning, and likely because of the subject matter, given that it was the seventies and stuff. Mm -hmm. But he's like, "An enemy of Murray's on at two a.m. Hey, do you want to watch it with me?" And I'm like, uh -huh. "Absolutely, Dad. That'd be great." And, uh, and he was so he was. I was um, like fourteen or fifteen. Wow. Again, two in the morning. And it was great. It's a because, long movie. <laughs> yeah. And it was great because, I mean, it's everything about it. But literally, he's like, you know, this movie was like banned in cities. This sure. was like really taboo stuff. And I've seen the Preminger documentary, Anatomy of a Director, that was made in the early 80s. And Burgess Meredith narrates it. They got Jimmy Stewart talking about Anatomy of a Murder. And even his father 
is like, I cannot believe you made a dirty picture. Well, not, not, not that. It's it's not a dirty picture. But it's very now, let adult. me show it to I mean, you. They all know we, you know what you're talking about, and, and it's adult enough not to make it about good or evil or guilty or not. It's just like, who's going to win this case? That's what it comes down to. Oh, God. And young George C. Scott? As the as the uh, as you know, dancer, yeah, yeah, Mr. Dancer from Lansing, absolutely, and uh, and, Bean and Floyd the barber, and yes, as okay. the one of the one of the medical examiner doctors, uh -huh. absolutely, the whole movie, top to bottom, and the guy, and I always forget his name, the character actor from uh, Jaws that plays the mayor of the town. Yeah, oh, um, Murray, Murray Hamilton, Murray Hamilton, yeah, thank you, absolutely, very good, and Eve Arden, Eve Arden is a star, Eve She's Arden, great. tough lady, terrific. But here's the thing. You say that, you know, it's an adult movie and all that, but the way Preminger was working as this independent producer is he picked topics for that sensation. Oh, of course. Of course. So, I mean, the moon is blue. because It's blue. Know, Absolutely. Bob you know, uh, Yes. <laughs> every movie, the moon is blue is probably one of the weakest films. In the but they were all, they had, you know, that was his gimmick, right? That, yeah. Ad I, advising I, consent. I was just going to say advising consent, which is. Uh, yeah, that had homosexuality, but on and on. There was a taboo. There was a line that he was going to cross, and that was going to be used in the advertising and promotional campaign. They were going to get, you know, all kinds of articles about outrage, and that's all stuff that he was very happy to get. Right? Absolutely, he wanted his films to be these things that people can't believe they're making a movie like this now. I can't. I have no problem with that. <laughs> well, I want to see. In a way, he was like you could say he was sort of like a William Castle guy, except his gimmicks were legit gimmicks. They were about that's content. A, yeah, that's, that's a, a good that's comparison. A, that's a fair comparison. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so was it, I mean, again, I, I definitely want to check out Brothers Rico. That's cool. I want to, Hill, I want us to talk about Illegal because okay. um, I really was delighted by the film uh, <laughs> for its, for its cheesiness. And I, I mean, it is, it is absolutely a, a very silly melodramatic late noir, but it is, I, I really do enjoy it for all of its, if you, if not flaws, just again, how, Overly sensationalized, they tried to make and over dramatized, but I do love it because it's just great. Late Robinson to me, before he, before he got to senior citizen roles like he had in the sixties, right? And, yeah. you, know, in, you know, in those other movies and stuff. So it's kind of like the last lead to me that that Edward made, Edward G. made. Well, what what did I call it, John? When you you were talking about, I think it, I think I said it's entertaining, like Holcomb. Holcomb, uh, yes, Holcomb. It is Holcomb. It is Holcomb. It's based on a 1929 play called The Mouthpiece, okay? okay? And it had been made as a film two or three times prior. Is that, is that Warren, Warren William? It is. I think yes. I've seen yes. one of those, the pre-code. And, yeah. and the, problem, the problem I have with it is that it was old-fashioned by the time it was made, right? So mm -hmm. judging, I'm not judging it by its standards of today. I'm judging it by its standards of 1955. <laughs> you know, and, and you know it made the asphalt jungle. You know the, the, these great movies about crime that, and they're right. making this cornball thing about the morality of this guy who's jumping from one side of the wall to the other. It, it was cornball by its in its own era, right? Absolutely, so, absolutely. But and I then you get Jane Mansfield playing a human being, which is, <laughs> you know, not, not a rare character. thing. <laughs> absolutely, no. It, it, you're right, Hill. I mean, that's the thing. It's like. The most understated Jane Mansfield role I think she ever had, and it was yeah. probably one of her first roles. Oh, uh, okay. I don't know about that. I don't know if I agree with that. Um, isn't she in? Um, oh, what's the movie? Um, the girl can't help it. No, I'm just kidding. no. The exactly. burglar. She's in the burglar, and I actually think she's a lot better in the burglar. Okay, she's I've never seen it. I've never seen it, but I'll take your word for it. Cool. She is not a human being. So she's like this weird sex bot. Okay. Whereas in the burglar, I think she's actually pretty good. For I mean, for her, she's. Oh, you know, terrible. wait a minute—is that the Dan Duryea movie, The yep. Burglar? Oh, okay, of course. Shame on me. You're 100 percent right, and of course that's a superior movie. I mean, she's barely, other than wow, who the hell is that? In illegal, yeah. and and I'm sure that mm -hmm. helped her a lot, and in, in becoming what she did later with Girl Can't Help It and will success Spoil Rock yeah, Hunter. Sure. But that's why I love it. It's just like you can't much like Marilyn in her early films where she would have these bit roles, you can't take your eyes off her. I mean, she really is like, well, wow, who's that? From a yeah, very yeah, animal standpoint. You compare her acting. I mean, when was, uh, when was Asphalt Jungle made? Uh, 
uh, was it 54 55 because yeah. of the yeah. they were made back, you know really close together yeah so you can compare them in terms of acting you can compare the stories and all this stuff as contemporaneous films sure Marilyn Monroe with you big banana head and you know all the she was actually really good in that film now obviously she had a great director this film was made by whatever Lewis Allen, not 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 not, not the level of the John Hughes. Of course not. <laughs> but, but no, nobody coaches anything out of her in this movie. I mean, I, I was mentioning the final. Will you have not seen the film, or I, ha you know, I have seen it, but it's been a little while. But I, ha I caught it on Turner a couple years ago, I think. She actually gets a couple of, you know, she. There's a scene where she has to answer the phone, and. <laughs> Think. Like there's a moment where she has to pause while she's talking to someone and she's in between the guy on the phone and her boss and she has to think. And it's to me one of the most charmingly hilarious moments <laughs> where the actor is going, How do I act when I'm thinking? You know, she does because you're just going through the ABC of how you think. But, but my favorite bit is the very final shot. I won't give away the story, but every it's a courtroom scene, it's a courtroom, you know, it's a film about lawyers, and there's a lot of courtroom scenes. Anyway. Everyone is standing up in the court to witness what has just transpired. And they're all like leaning forward and looking. And she's in the witness stand. <laughs> and I I draw the sexy cartoon women for a living sometimes, right? So I know what you do. You you know, you you do this weird arch back thing where the buttocks are sticking uh -huh. out one way and the chest is sticking out the other. And it's all about this exaggerated posture that, that comes out of a, you know, like a Jack Cole Playboy cartoon or something. Totally. Well, she, that's how she moves in every scene and every movie. That even when she's playing a dramatic, you know, not not playing the goofy character, she's playing in a dramatic film. She can't help it. And when she stands up, okay, can't help it. Uh, they kind of hold it. <laughs> they hold it over the, you know, the end comes up. So everyone's standing there. She leans forward, standing up, and she's right in the front of the front. <laughs> and it's she's the standing there, pushing her chest out. It is the. It's like, and then she has to hold it for like five seconds. <laughs> Absolutely, it's not as broad as Johnny Guitar was that fine it's western, with, you know. But but it's it's kind of in that realm, and that's why it was a lot of fun to watch. And it would be again. I mean, we we love these movies, and we sincerely love these movies. But it is like kind of a great late or mid fifties kind of movie that you know people could easily make fun of. And I mean, that you know, like you said, Edward G. Johnny playing Guitar the self consciously stylized it was not just a, a, a cornball movie oh no 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 absolutely I don't defend johnny guitar to the death here <laughs> all right fair enough okay but i but i guess like you said but it about, is a little over the top i mean johnny guitar over the top, but they're doing it intentionally oh for sure the reason it's 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 more like it's more like one of these musical melodrama kind of things where it's stylized as opposed mm -hmm. to in, in bad taste okay you know, yeah, yeah but yeah. Uh, yeah. I agree with you, Hill, when you said that for uh, it sick. came, you know, Illegal came out at the same time when we were getting good cutting edge movies and it was kind of a throwback. And it reminds me of those late 60s studio films that were kind of competing against Easy Rider and some of the groundbreaking yeah. early, you know, late 60s, early 70s movies where it's yeah. like, no, man, the game's over here now. What are you guys trying to do? You don't, you know, you're painting your wagons, for example. All those musicals that came out in the wake of like Sound of Music, you know, trying to get that box office. And oh, yeah. Oh, good lord! Yeah. You know, if you're going, if you're moving into the '60s, we mentioned Temple Drake. The one of the things that I just it's, you know, I, it, it, you cringe when you watch films from the '60s and '70s because almost countless filmmakers, because they could, there's going to be a rape scene, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And yep. It, yep. You know, it's excruciating to watch this stuff with you know eyes of today, like. They're putting in there clearly for this, you know, the sensation for right? the titillation. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't advance the storyline. You know, like, there's just going to be a scene where a woman is there's this horrible thing, and we see it from the eyes of the the rapist typically, and it's just like God. That was that's what Americans did with their freedom. Of. I'll tell you, it even lasted into the eighties because there's uh, oh, and wait, I, and yeah, I, definitely in the eighties because uh, absence of malice of all movies, the uh, the Paul Newman Sally Field Sally movie. Field. There's a scene where he's so angry at her, he almost rapes her. And it is so disturbing and shocking. And she is properly in the scene mortified, but he's just so yeah. angry at her. Mm -hmm. that he throws her on the bed and he rips her shirt. And he's like, what do you want to hear? And it's just like, wow. And it's like, 
you f- I mean, really, I I remember seeing the film and going, oh, you know, that's kind of an underrated Newman movie, and I still think it is. But that scene is really very cringy, uh, well, you know, for today's eyeballs, and it was blowing my mind because one of the uh, stream picks, screen picks, is one of the channels that I now have on Xfinity that has been running it the last couple of months, and I'm like, wow. And there's a great Wilfred Brimley closeout scene of that that's kind of an informal hearing. And it's Wilford Brimley at his Wilford Brimley is Brimley is <laughs> yeah, but he's great, and it's amazing because he's really young. He he was like Abe Vigoda, where he was always yeah. playing like twenty years older than he actually was. And his yeah. Brimliest is that what you say? Yeah, his well, just well, sir. I'll tell you. I mean, in that great barbershop mustache of his, uh-huh. I don't okay. know what I'm seeing right now, but one of these things is going to happen. First of all, somebody's ass is going to be in my briefcase by the end of the day. Excuse me, Margaret. You know, talking to the court reporter and shit. Oh, it's so funny. I mean, really, he I takes over the movie in that last scene. I saw you know, when you go on TV, so I, I know exactly what you're talking. About. You know what it made you made me think of? It, you know, like th- that new openness. Like it was uh, Ride the High Country, the Sam Peckinpah film. I mm-hmm. assume you've seen. Sure. There's, yeah. you know, incredible scene in a brothel where you know there's a marriage taking place, but she's. You know, the, the, what, what's the name of the actress who plays the, the young woman in the, that film? She's brought there. You know, she doesn't realize who she's marrying and what this family is like. Of these, but, and that's Peck and Pot, and she's essentially well, you know, she's going to be raped by her husband basically. But she's being thrown around from one drunken lot to another, and you know, it's I think that's Peck and Pot one indulging in a little what he'd like to indulge in, but also to kind of show. He wanted to sort of answer what he thought was phony about westerns, right? In all kinds of ways. He, you know, his movies became about, about professionals instead of, you know, it wasn't about the moral, but it was about some sort of code. Uh, he was trying to be more realistic, and I think that's what he was doing. Then you get into all these minor, you know, less less people with less to stay or less integrity. Just well, no, we have to throw in sex because that's what's going to sell. No, sure. It, it, you know, and. Was it was it Marianne Hartley? Yeah, Marianne Hartley. Who you know, yeah. Later yes. made the uh, TV the uh, Polaroid commercials with James Garner. James right? Garner, that's right. <laughs> that's Marianne. what I'll always know her for. <laughs> that well, that and she's in the the second to last Star Trek episode where she's all our yesterdays, where she plays kind of the alien in the in the cave that Spock falls in love with. And she's in a right. great she's in a great Twilight Zone episode where she falls in love with a guy before he takes off into space, and you know. I don't want to give away the plot. That's, that's a all. great. That's it's a fantastic great. Twilight Zone. Really? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and Lansing, she's in, Robert Lansing's the guy. That's a Robert great. Lansing, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yes, a fantastic Twilight Zone. And also, she's in uh, that great two-part uh, Incredible Hulk where she's a doctor that's uh, dying from cancer and trying to cure Bill Bixby. And she won an Emmy for that. And wow. it really is like a very sweet. I must have seen that when it was. Yeah, I don't remember that. But I'm, yeah. I watched every episode as a kid, so. No, but she's a perfectly fine actress. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. No, she's, she's treated she's horribly. Her, her character is treated horribly in Ride the High Country. Ride the High Country. Have you, you know, guys? I haven't watched Track Down, and and the Robert Culp Western from the early '60s. And Peck and Paw was like kind of the the guiding force behind. It would only lasted one season, mm-hmm. but he was kind of the guiding. Right. I oh. forgot his about his involvement. I only have caught it because it's. Probably was on the Grit Channel or one of these channels that's showing TV westerns. I'd never seen it before. Um, uh, and there's God. There's another one. You know, they, they all kind of had the feel uh, of if they're close to anything as, as wanted, dead or alive, right? Yes. They had young stars as opposed to you know more classic kind of western hero. They had young guys. Right. With them. And Robert Culp played that really tough, just like just like uh, Steve McQueen did with Wanted Dead or Alive. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm thinking you know, there's a third one. The Rebel. Have you seen that one? Yes, of course. With uh, mm-hmm. and I'm forgetting his name, Nick Adams. Nick Adams, right? Yeah, yeah, another- yeah. Absolutely, man. No, again, uh, fascinated think- by these shows. Absolutely. These are all the shows that are referenced in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Though. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah. End scene. <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. We can, guys. We can wrap if you want. It's up to you guys. I mean, if you guys are tired and you know, whatever. I mean. We've been going almost two hours, but I've really I think enjoyed. You guys at work today. You took a nap, and I was drawing your your scene missing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks, Hill. Seriously, that's I, that's really kind of you to do it. I I, I appreciate. It. I'm sure you're doing it 
most likely because of my lack of graphic skill with my little lobby cards for these various things. <laughs> no, we were we ended up talking about it. I think uh, you you said I should have asked you about stuff, and and then uh, you, you, as soon as you mentioned, I'm like, well. I don't have everything pressing today. I'll, uh, <laughs> That's amazing. I might use it for my classic Hollywood trivia contest as well as seeing this thing, if that's well, okay. Well, first of all, I have to finish it. I'm looking for the I understand. What I'm looking for right now is the perfect silhouette reference for the Hollywood boom mic, excuse me, boom mic, used like in the 1940s, right? The, you know, the big, the big uh, like, the, they hold out the big rod. with the, Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I keep looking at these stills that I'm finding, you know, these on the set sort of photographs from the 1940s and the microphones were huge i mean they were like gigantic mm -hmm. they looked like uh i don't know they looked like more like a, a giant like uh spotlight kind of thing but it's the microphone and i it doesn't quite when i'm putting it in this drawing i don't know if people today would recognize it as a mic because we're used is to the one, longer boom mic yeah is there one in this is going to get a little obscure but not that yeah. obscure the trailer for Citizen Kane, where yeah. Wells is talking, and there, it's I see like there's a scene of a mic cold, that right? kicks in. Yeah. That's not obscure at all. What are you talking oh, yeah. about? Well, That's I was awesome. talking the trailer as opposed to the well, movie. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's in the, right, right, in the trailer. Oh, okay. I, when when I was in college, we would get. After this. Thank you. I'll, I'll yeah. Thank you. That's in college, a lot of times we'd get um, previews of, of movies that hadn't hit the theaters yet, and they'd ask us our opinions of them. And I remember the Chevy Chase Goldie Hawn comedy seems like old times. Mm -hmm. And there's a courtroom scene. And I don't think it was in the final cut, but the cut we had, you clearly see a boom microphone. And obviously it was an 80s boom microphone that looked more like a construction crane for a more modern reference, I suppose. Uh, but yeah, it was just like, whoa, I can't believe that's, you know. But again, I'm, I'm assuming it was a preview cut. Yeah. They just sometimes to get they don't on. frame up the preview cuts before they. So, I mean, they know the mics, you know, they don't. Well, I re I remember seeing some very lame uh, Tom Conway um, Don Watts oh. movie in the in probably in the eighties or seventies, and I forget which one it was, but I couldn't believe that almost every other shot had to like it. Huh. And I wondered, you know, you you know, at that at that point, I might not have known enough that oh, gee, the guy in the projecting booth is actually using the wrong lens because you're not supposed to show me. Oh, sure. Yeah. If there's a bleed on every side that's sort of a given when you're making a movie. Interesting. Um, but, uh, no, I I, saw, I watched the print of uh, the, the restored print. I went I went to the film center here in Chicago to see the restored print of Night of the Hunter, one, another one of my favorite movies. Oh, one of the greats. And there's, there's, there's Mike stuff in there, and... Uh, and I didn't know if it was that they, you know, it was the projection or something about the because I hadn't remembered seeing a microphone in the film before. But you know, it was the first film made by the director, so you never know. Maybe there sadly, was sadly the only film made by very sadly, right? Very yeah. very. Sadly. Hey, uh, I want us to talk if you guys have seen this, and we can save it for next time as far as the conversation goes. But um. I am fascinated, and I haven't seen the whole movie yet, and that's one of the reasons why I don't want to talk about it yet until I've seen it all the way through. But there's an early 50s Mickey Rooney movie that is a noir called Quicksand. Oh, yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. All right, I've heard of it, it, but I haven't seen it. I really... I'll, I'll track it down, though. I'm I know, a sucker and, for Rooney. All right, and Hill, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to warn you now because I know you, you cringe when I say this because so many great movies, and sadly with the pandemic and the likelihood that it's going to be a while before really people start going again to movie theaters, and especially... For the kind of fringe stuff we're talking about, it'll be interesting. I mean, I really, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for the best for things mm -hmm. like uh, the Noir City Festivals and things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. But um, a lot of these movies are on YouTube. A lot of these movies are on Amazon Prime. Uh, again, or, I or you could buy a DVD. I mean, you could buy a DVD. Are, Not the best way to see them. I agree that they should be seen on the big screen. Is, but you know, is Quicksand uh, the one with Peter Lorre? I believe so. I'm going to look up the cast okay. right now. Oh, I got to yeah, check that he, out. He made a couple of films that, uh, that, that you know, a couple of these. Uh, he, he he made a number of films, uh, you know, post Indy Hardy, where he was playing kind of, you know, in sort of criminal situations. Um, it is Peter Lorre, yes. But my favorite of his films in that era, by far, is um, uh, Drive a Crooked, Crooked Road. Yes. Uh, I've never that, seen that. that is not the, the B category film. Well, I mean, look, we, we throw around this term B. Most of these films aren't actual Bs. 
what they are are low budget films. They're right. bees, bees were programmers typically. They were you know Charlie Chan, Ma, 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 Ma Kettle, Blondie. Well, well, either believe me, there's much lower categories than those guys. But yeah, but you know, typically the, these are just these are just you know like they, they come they're they're big budget movies or rather they're the A product but from a smaller studio. Right? Gotcha. They're um, not. Yeah. Uh, Gene Cagney in Quicksand, Jack Elam in Quicksand, and yes, Peter Lorre as well. And uh, it's on Amazon can... Prime. So if you yes, get it, and it's on with I like Quicksand just fine, but Drive a Crooked Road is. Probably my favorite Mickey Rooney movie because they, they he plays it against his typical character of that brash you know yeah. outgoing character. Um, there's another one where he plays a drummer, and I don't know if it's sure oh, I don't know if it's a something story like it's a city thing, um, but it's it's that was pretty wacky. They have some like very famous musicians playing in jazz bands, and he sits in with them, but he then gets hooked into crime as well. Oh. There's, speaking of that, there's a British um, Othello uh, adaptation yeah. that's in the jazz era with Patrick McGowan called All Night yeah. Long. That's and right. I that's saw right. that for the first time, and it's a fantastic movie. It's, that's fascinating, yeah. I'd like, I had That one I have not seen yet. I, I have seen uh, Hell Drivers, which is, uh, which is pretty great with Patrick McGowan. I don't know. Did you see that one? Okay. Yes, absolutely. And mm -hmm. honestly, those uh, and uh, you know Connery's pre Bond fifties movies, I think, are interesting. James Mason made some really interesting fifties mm -hmm. British movies. I'm uh, really uh, what was happening in England while the golden age of Hollywood into in, well into the fifties and stuff. I love a lot of those uh, you know films from uh, from England and stuff. I think they're very interesting to watch. So there you go. All right, let's wrap up if we will, boys. Uh, well done. Great conversation. I'm sorry that yeah. it's been so long since we've done a good scene missing. Uh, we can reconvene in a, in a month or so and then do more if you guys want and invite other people like Mike Cronenberg uh, maybe be a fourth uh, would be a fun guy to include. Jim or Jim, Mike, Jim Terry would be fun to have, They're absolutely. Great. And so, we're, we're forgetting our friend in Los Angeles who uh, was with us at one point. But, uh, who's our friend in Los Angeles? Our friend, the storyboard artist. Well, we'll, uh, we'll talk about oh, it. Um, um, oh, Gabe Hartman, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, game. Part of the original crew. Yeah, absolutely. No, and you're right about that. And in fact, to uh, pull up my little uh, see missing uh, logo and stuff, I found a, a, a an episode where you uh, you and Gabe were on. No, Gabe's great though, and so is, so is his wife Karina Becco. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it would obviously it might have to be a little bit later in the evening, given that they're West Coast. Um, so that's just a, a concern for those of us who actually are still on a proper sleep schedule. Me, <laughs> I'm all over the place. I'm waking up at three in the morning, absolutely wide awake, doing four or five hours of work, falling asleep again till early afternoon. Or like today, I had my total afternoon nap that started at two o'clock and I woke up at like 530. I'm like, Jesus Christ, there goes the day. <laughs> well, you know, the time isn't as important for me. Any later than this, like if we started now, I'd probably be. Yes. Well, that's why I'm warning it, because, yeah, we would likely probably start for to get Gabe on and stuff like that. Unless, yeah, you know, but if Gabe isn't if Gabe is working at home and working on his own stuff, the hours may be. Hey, we don't have to talk about this. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It's all right. He may, he may, want to, he may not want to be a part of this anyway. But, uh, I understand. Well, no, I think he I, he always enjoys talking old movies. I had him and Karina on uh, a couple weeks ago. And I mean, primarily to talk about what they were doing in comics. Mm -hmm. But no, we, we talked old movies and stuff. Absolutely. No, they, and God, man, I'll tell you here a great story about Gabe. And he, next time we're all together, he can tell you more. He went to one of Jack Webb's old homes and they were having an estate sale and had a lot of original Jack Webb curios and wow. things at the house. And it was just like fascinating uh, hearing about Jack Webb's house and amazing. You, you know, could again, do an entire show on Jack Webb. I love yeah. Jack Webb. The, I'm fascinated uh, the, by Jack Webb. I, the movie I, he, I don't know if I love him, but I'm fascinated. He's I'm get fascinated by him as well. And I, I, Jack Webb book, right? What's that? There you go. <laughs> well, and then that, that because weird... Because you brought him up, i got to ask you guys a question. I just... It's, it just hit me at some point when I'm watching one of his films, or one, one episode that he directed of Dragon, you know, whatever it was, and I go... Jack Webb ADD because it's like OCD. Excuse me, OCD. OCD. I understand what you're saying. Yeah, OCD. Yeah. The way he stuck with the format was unlike the way anyone ever stuck mm -hmm. with the format anywhere. 
it's like you can't move the camera, you can't do this. People have to talk this way. There's a there's a trailer. Speaking of trailers, there's a trailer for the PI where he's in the barracks, and I guess he's talking about the movie, right? And mm -hmm. he's, this well, I, I guess yeah. There's rows of beds or rows of yeah, in the barracks. I sure, forget yeah. where. And he and the camera follows him, or he walks down one side, and then he, the camera has to it does the mirror image thing on the other side, and I'm like, this is so weirdly like you know like. You know, like having to mirror the shot. Not, I can't just have the camera move here and follow it. No, it's going to do the mirror. You can just see his mind working. And I'm like, I know. Okay, that's that what fascinates me. Have you had this <laughs> no, but I, I could see it. And also, I just talked to Rick Green, uh, this wonderful Canadian comedian who is suffering from the condition ADHD, and it's attention deficit. Yeah. And I forget what the stands for. Disorder. Yeah, yeah, it is hyperactivity disorder. Thank you, guys. And and yeah, um, and, 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 and truly, when you think about Webb, he likely would have been a guy like that as well. But I mistakenly uh, said whatever I said. ADD I, and OCD. OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Yeah, well, maybe and that's not the hyperactive thing. That's not what I meant. I've no, but saying. no, but again, there is that kind of weird idiosyncratic style mm -hmm. of his film and television making. That again, I do find fascinating, but he is kind of one of those. I mean, really, if people only know him from being Joe Friday on Dragnet, you don't know how much of a production force he was right. in television. And then even his movies, that weird army comedy he made with Mitchum, Trouble and with Oscar, Trouble with Harry, or whatever it was called. It's in, um, yeah, Ernie Kovacs Actually, is in that, right? Isn't I, I believe so. Yeah. And then, you know, so. God, you know, and I, but it, it's not. It's not a great movie, but it's an interesting no. movie mm -hmm. because oh. all these non – although I did – you know, Webb did a comedy, a sketch comedy radio show no. in the 40s that yeah. actually I find very funny. No, I was going to say, I, haven't, I don't even know if I've heard it. I know I, I've heard of it. I may have heard an episode. On, on Steve Darnell's old radio show, he played it. Yeah. And Chuck, mm -hmm. Chuck used to play it. Shaden used to play it. Right. Okay. I don't know if I've heard it. Is that, but he, he played a detective, and he's on – Suspense. Oh God, Pat Pat Novak for hire is a tremendous show. Yeah, no, that stuff to me is his most creative stuff and his most interesting stuff. He really plays around with like satire of detective shows and and some of that stuff. Anyway, I find that fascinating a oh. lot, a lot more fascinating than the actual Dragnet TV show. The radio show, you know, I really like the Dragnet show. Oh yeah, when it moved into TV. I think early on, I might I might want to watch some of those early. I like the fifties dragnets. Mm -hmm. The fifties dragnets yeah. are great. Sixties dragnets. Yeah. I, think we I just got done watching every sixties dragnet on our local me TV or whatever. Yeah. That's awesome. But watching the sixties stuff, it's like you know. And then when they did dragnet nineteen seventy, <clears throat> it's just so weird because it's like taking place in this alternate universe, you know? Right. Yeah. yeah. And it, toward well, the end, as the show goes on, it doesn't even leave the police station. Sometimes it'll be him making a speech for half an hour. And he insisted when he's talking to someone, the other actors had to read off a teleprompter. They weren't allowed to memorize their lines. It's so yeah. bizarre. But I because love all that. What he did. He somehow thought that made it fun. I don't right. know. Or natural or whatever. Yeah. Because they were like hearing the lines for the first time. Nimoy, right. Leonard Nimoy talked about <gasps> being on, on 50s Dragnet and how idiosyncratic the way it was mm -hmm. shot and everything. And also uh, Steve Cannell. Uh, in his great uh, oral history interview that he did, talked a lot about working with Webb on Adam 12 because he wrote a lot of early Adam 12s. Mm -hmm. And it's really, again, a fascinating man, a very fascinating man who had a very idiosyncratic way of shooting yeah. his stuff. Very yeah, interesting. And not just very idiosyncratic, completely unique. There is yeah. no one in Nobody else like him. But again, somebody, kind of like Douglas Sirk. I mean, he's uh, that's what I'm saying. I mean, and Sirk had more yeah, art, he had more artistry. Completely opposite ends of the spectrum. That's but that's so what I'm saying, man. Again, it was much more artistry. But that said, you can't. I, I, there are guys, there are filmmakers that you can't help but watch the way they make. May they make. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> so yeah. in a very general yeah. way. Them in the same sentence. <laughs> oh my I god! Just did. I just oh did. Oh. <laughs> All right, boys. We'll wrap right. up. Well mm -hmm. done. Good job, guys. Seriously, yeah, I loved job. I loved every part of this conversation. Seriously, was great. So uh, my favorite part was when we couldn't hear Will. <laughs> that was everyone's favorite part. <laughs> and that reminds me, another thing 
for people I'm, to go home and watch in the mid 80s because we were making fun of the silent era thames tv the british production company made an incredible 10-part look at the silent era called hollywood that james yeah. mason narrates and it is outstanding and you will see footage from silent films you've never seen before really? and it is a very thoughtful look at the silent era and thankfully there were a lot of actors and technicians that were still alive that could give first-hand accounts of making these movies and these filmmakers and stars it is i i rediscovered it on youtube in the last couple of weeks and instead of watching stuff on tv i've been down that youtube rabbit hole and it's nice. been incredible incredible i will check that out all right all right, all right. there all right, we go well, anyway everybody thanks a lot for watching thank you will thank you hill for uh for being here for this conversation and like i said yeah we can we can do it again in a few weeks and we'll uh, we'll talk more old hollywood uh, here on word balloon scene missing thanks Let's a lot for watching everybody take care and we'll talk to you soon